Good evening, and thank you for viewing the September 7th meeting of the Arcata City Council. The City Council meeting is being held as a hybrid meeting with both in-person attendance and teleconference access via Zoom. Before we begin, we just finished up a closed session, um, and we have a quick report out. Um, we looked into the disposition of a couple of parcels, um, and our plans go to comply with the Surplus Land Act and uh, provide affordable housing noticing for that those parcels, obtain a revised appraisal for the parcels, go through the RFP and listing of the parcel process if affordable housing is not viable, um, and then proceed with the disposition of the parcels. Uh, there was a motion made by Councilmember Stillman and seconded by Councilmember Watson, and it passed. Good. Okay, um, so first item on our agenda this evening, we are going to begin with a land acknowledgement. The City of Arcata acknowledges that the lands we are located on are the unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat tribe. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the red. Past actions by local, state, and federal governments removed the Wiat and other indigenous peoples from the land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The City of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy narratives of settler colonialism. Um, our second item, if you'd like to join us, please join us for the flag salute. Will the city manager please call? Vice Mayor Schaefer? Here. Councilmember Watson? Councilmember Matthews? Here. Councilmember Philman? Mayor Acton Salazar is absent tonight. You have a quorum. Thank you. If you wish to make comment during the meeting, either at the two open public comment periods or for an individual agenda item, there are three ways to do so. If you are here in person, please line up behind the podium when the item you would like to speak on is accepting public comment. And just a reminder, um, I know we are doing the card system for early oral communications, so if you are commenting at the beginning of the meeting on an item not on the agenda, make sure to grab your card. If you have not also, we'll accept the first four people here, then move to Zoom, and then if there's more time during that 15 minute period, we'll go back to in person. Um, if you are logged onto Zoom, click raise your hand when it is time for public comment on the agenda item you wish to speak. And number three, if you are on the phone, make sure to press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your turn, you will be prompted to dial star six on your phone. Um, again, for each item, we will take in-person public comment first and then move to our online comments. We are not going to be going back and forth, so if you are wanting to comment, please line up at the podium or raise your electronic hand as soon as comment is requested for that item. Um, okay, next we will be moving on to ceremonial matters, and our first item is a proclamation recognizing September 21st, 2022 as International Day of Peace. This proclamation will be read by Council Member Matt. A proclamation recognizing September 21st, 2022 as the International Day of Peace. Whereas the International Day of Peace was established by the United Nations in 1981 as an observance in September and in 2001, the UN General Assembly set September 21st as an annual day of nonviolence and ceasefire. The theme for 2022 is End Racism, Build Peace. And whereas, whereas the United Nations recognizing that lasting peace requires protection of the human rights of all people, social justice and development, economic justice, quality and equity in health care and health services, environmental justice and climate action, and that all are critical parts of the peace process. And whereas we recognize that the real peace requires elimination of racism in all forms, that racism has created and reinforced inequalities between nations and between peoples within nations, and that these inequities and the resulting conflict exacerbate the ongoing and increasing efforts effect of global warming and the COVID pandemic on human society. This International Day of Peace will be dedicated to learning about racism, collecting and sharing ideas for repairing the damage and making better connections and putting them into action. The world is invited to unite in ending racism and changing our planet for the better in all aspects. And whereas worldwide, nationally, and locally, groups, individuals are working to learn about, recognize, and eliminate racism in all forms, and to create a peaceful and more inclusive human society. And whereas the United Nations invites all governments, nations, and communities to renounce racism and end conflict, and instead promote peace and harmony by commemorating the day through education, and raising public awareness, ending racism, and 
supporting human rights for all people. There is hope of strengthening the culture of peaceful living by seeking to understand ourselves and others, accepting people of different cultures, countries, and religions, and celebrating our differences to make the world an interconnected, peaceful, and healthy place, which history has shown can be done. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council, the City of Arcata, hereby recognizes September 21st, 2022, as the International Day of Peace and encourages the community to work together to end racism and create lasting peace for all people, locally and globally. Dated September 7th, 2022, by Mary. And I believe we have um, Martha Hart on the proclamation. Yep, go ahead, Martha, we can hear you. Okay, good, thank you. Hello, our city council participants. Thank you for the proclamation. My name is Martha Hart. I'm from Kunle Community International League for Peace, Freedom, or Wealth. The increased threat of nuclear war or nuclear is the constant strain. The ongoing and increased challenge of climate change, fascinating complex, and the global and local caused by historic racism. Now is a good time to celebrate and rededicate ourselves. Kunle Community is a peer support organization in the county and runs a warm line on weekends and offers mental health free energy. Thank you for this year's United Nations National Day of is end race so that any country are demanding race of outlook I will celebrate this day for rights. I will also be attending a Zoom candlelight peace vigil put on by WILF, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and Kunle Community. Go to kunlecommunity.org forward slash events for the meeting ID and hope passcode. Hope to see you there. Thank you again for this proclamation. Thank you, Martha. We appreciate you joining us this evening. Okay. Uh, item B will be a proclamation in recognition of Coastal Cleanup Month, September 2022. And this will be read by Council Member Stillman. Proclamation of the City of Arcata in recognition of a Coastal Cleanup Month with September 2022. Whereas the state of California has a varied coastline of sandy beaches, rocky shores, productive estuaries, marshes, tidal flats, urban areas, and harbors. And whereas the marine environment is one of the most valuable resources of recreation, tourism, fishing, and other coastal activities. Coastal protection is responsible, shared by residents and the business community and the public institutes. And whereas the North Coast Environmental Center is the Humboldt County's organizer for 2022 Coastal Cleanup Month, taking place every weekend in September, during which an anticipated 1,000 people will clean beaches, rivers, and estuaries along the entire Humboldt County coastline. Whereas the North Coast Environmental Center's Beach Beautification Program, now adopted A Beach, began in Humboldt County over 40 years ago and is now celebrated throughout California and around the world. Last year, Humboldt County volunteers picked up over 5,000 pieces of trash from around the shorelines and coast. And whereas the residents can be proud that this year, after year after year, Humboldt County continues to be among the state leaders and number of volunteers who help keep our oceans, rivers, and coastlines clean. <clears throat> now, therefore, be proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Arcata recognizes the month of September as Coastal Cleanup Month and encourages businesses, individuals, service groups, and public institutions to safely hit the beaches to jointly promote a healthy, productive coastal environment. Dated September 7th, 2022, signed by Vice Mayor Sarah Schaefer. Um, let's see, is Ivy present? Thank you. Coast Environmental Center, um, and I want to thank you guys for the proclamation, as well as, oh, wonderful. Encourage folks to um, check out a list of cleanups on our website where they can sign up to volunteer. We have prizes and it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, okay. Ivy. Thank you, Ivy.
Okay, that will take us to our uh, fifth item on the agenda here, which is a report by commission or committee. Um, and this evening we have our annual report from the Public Safety Committee, uh, this evening presented by Fred Johansson. So thank you, Fred. Um, let's hear what you got. You already have a copy? Okay, good. Okay. Well, I live at uh, 2295 Ross Street, and I just want to say thank you to Emily's crew for picking up a bed on the walking street last week. And uh, it seems that they're really on it right now. I gotta just say, I'm, re I'm really happy there. Uh, so uh, I'll get with the intro here and uh, you'll hear what we've been doing this year, which I think we're trying to, in I know we're trying to include everyone on our committee in, in what we do. So here we go. Uh, our committee was formed in 2018 in response to an attempted rape of a 12-year-old girl in Cahill Park. Meetings were organized by the city and a committee was created to develop solutions to improve the safety of school children to get to and from Arcata Elementary. As a result of the findings of that uh, committee, our public safety committee was created by municipal code. Since our committee was created, we've undertaken tasks for the council in the wake of George Floyd's death and the creation of Black Lives Matter. We recommended that, or what was, has now become our MIST program and have overseen the implementation in our police department with California state mandated police reform. We've also witnessed that every officer is trained in de-escalation tactics and seen the reform of our use of force rules. Part of this was, of course, due to the death of Josiah Lawson and the recommended reforms suggested by the National Police Reforms Report from that. More recently, there were, are problems that our police forces had to deal with. During the past two years, the COVID pandemic brought many challenges. It was inter interesting for us to see which types of crimes increased and which of those decreased. We had a flurry of smash and grab robberies throughout the city. Those have abated, but what question was always asked, do you have a camera? We had and continued to see the theft of catalytic converters from automobiles and the increase uh, in auto theft. The last to me and the most heinous are our recent hate crimes. We will continue to be respons responsive to the needs of our public safety officers in our city. This year has been full of change. Notably, we are just coming out of COVID and Humboldt State University has become Cal Poly Humboldt and started a process of growth. The economy has changed and staffing has become difficult. Property values have skyrocketed and neighborhood housing is increasingly becoming owner occupied. Some neighborhoods are becoming gentrified, mine included. Our committee has two new members this year, Justin Fox and Laura Montaigne. They both have incredible backgrounds and we're grateful to have them on our committee. Our committee members have been active in our community this year. Several of us have participated in ride-alongs with the APD. We visited Carlson Park with Kuna to meet with the homeless there. Five of our members took part in the PIT count, myself included. And I would encourage members of the city council to participate in this next year. It is an eye-opener, okay? So the first of our recommendations is uh, the Northtown Bridge uh, project. And we've been working on this for quite a few years. And it started, really started with us with a SEPTED report, which is, I'm not reading here now. Um, Melissa Lazan, this is her, her baby that she's been working on. And I, she is now trained uh, with SEPTED, so she can do those reports. If you have problems or questions about the gate safety in the gateway project, She's the go-to person, okay? Just want you to know that. So the Northtown footbridge has long been a safety challenge for students and our community as a whole. As far back as 2006, a city-funded report stated this, that students referred to the footbridge as the gauntlet. At the formation of the Public ta Safety Task Force, precursor to the Public Safety Committee, the footbridge was at the center of our safe corridor plan. The idea being, that safely connected communities are thriving communities. In 2018, the Public Safety Committee requested a SEPTED report, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design from APD. 
This report revealed long, a long-standing need for landscaping to provide adequate line of sight for pedestrians as well as additional lighting, repair to the pavement, and concrete along the bridge. And unfortunately, the presence of human feces. We had somebody camping on the bridge. Since the initial report, there was a uh, there has been a pickup in momentum that resulted in the formation of a team consisting of artists from the Playhouse and HSU, Arcata Main Street, city staff, and HSU administration. In the spring and summer of 19, or 2022, momentum and attendance saw a drop due to uh, faculty turnover at Cal Poly Humboldt and the need for some of the team to temporarily shift focus. At the time, the Public Safety Committee reached out to Cal Poly Humboldt administration to determine next steps with an updated SEPTED report, which is included in our, uh, our uh, packet, and a proposal for a collaborative mural project. At this time, Cal Poly Humboldt administration is in discussion with the city of Arcata to determine how and what cooperation and shared resources are available for the project to move forward. The Public Safety Committee strongly recommends that the city council commit to making this project a priority. This includes staff time and funding to work with Cal Poly Humboldt to build a proposal for Caltrans that includes not only the needed safety improvements, but additional safety infrastructure such as a call box and or cameras, which HSU has on their side by the, or excuse me, Cal Poly Humboldt. Uh, the Public Safety Committee also recommends that the City Council consider how a collaborative mural involving university students and local artists fits with the existing Arcata Strategic Arts Plan. Improvements to the Northtown footbridge would also dovetail nicely with the already approved project to improve G &H Street, the G&H Street corridor to the plaza. Any future advancement on this project will require the full support of the City Council. Adequate funding from the city and the university and dedicated staff time to produce the proposal. And then uh, there's the note to look at the attached documents. Now this next project I led, um, two of our subcommittees were combined to combine the goal this year, this year to improve access for Cal Poly Humboldt. The new committee was named the Safe Quarters Committee. The purpose of this was to work with uh, uh, okay, CPH, you know, hey, it's an acronym. Uh, <laughs> so uh, to plan them for modal improvements on the Northtown Bridge, traffic between the proposed Craftsman's Mall dorms and along the G&H Street corridors. Uh, we met with the Vice President of Facilities Management, Mike, and C, uh, College, uh, uh, no, Cal Poly Humboldt Police Chief Morgan, who has since gone away, and now the acting head of uh, the Cal Poly uh, Humboldt Police, uh, uh, Jim Cress. I also provided a letter to the, of the meeting held by Cal Poly concerning the new dorms and the Craftsman Small site. I also attended meetings of our planning commission, thank you, and uh, the Traffic Safety Committee. We also met with City Manager Karen Deemer numerous times to discuss these issues. Thanks for giving us your time. Our concern is the safety of students who will be traveling to and from the Craftsman Mall dorms. There are two entrances planned for the new facility. The northern entrance is St. Louis Road, which enters the western end of the new dorm facility. The 2017 Arcata tra Central Traffic Study notes that this route is unsafe for pedestrians and bicycles. There are no sidewalks and the normal truck traffic to Mad River Lumber Company is over 30 semi-trucks a day. And when I went there a day before yesterday, there was a semi waiting to be loaded, another one being loaded, and that truck was in the middle of St. Louis Road. Okay, just saying. The second proposed entrance on the south end of the development is I Street, and then to the street circle at the intersection on uh, Foster and Sunset Avenue via J Street. The two subsequent intersections en route to Cal Poly Humboldt are considered to be heavily impacted by traffic, by the Arcata traffic study. An added source of foot and bicycle traffic is the rails to rails route that enters between the Foster Avenue circle and the intersection at the top of the bridge. 
Uh, people living in this area, including my wife, have known in many close calls for pedestrians through these intersections today. Our re recommendation for the Craftsman Small Dorm Project is to conduct a traffic study to implement modifications to existing roads, bike, and pedestrian paths with the support and cooperation of Cal Poly Humboldt before the dorms are completed. Once the safety modifications are identified, I have no doubt that nature is going to take care of it. The heat, when you look at the 2017 a traffic study and you go over what was suggested, every one of the recommendations has been done. Okay? That's why I'm certain it's going to get done. Okay. So once the safety modifications are identified, we recommend that they be implemented, implemented as a high priority as soon as needed funding can be found. Okay. Then the next uh, recommendation is support for additional homeless uh, services. And both Anjali Browning and Melissa Lazan both work for Arcata House. So this is near and dear to our entire committee. So support the creation of a day use center, alternative shelter, and or navigation center to provide immediate housing solutions and services. Homelessness has been a public safety priority since the inception of the Public Safety Task Force and the subsequent Public Safety Committee, PSC. The PSC has previously recommended both long-term housing solutions as well as short-term assistance to meet the immediate needs of Arcata's unsheltered community members. With the expansion of federal and state funding available for homeless services in response to the pandemic, the city of Arcata seized the opportunity to make significant commitments to homeless solutions over the past year. Thank you. The PSC commends the city of Arcata for its sponsorship of two Home Key 2.0 projects, the only Home Key 2.0 projects awarded in Humboldt County. That will together add 138 new supportive housing units for people who are experiencing homelessness in Arcata or to Arcata housing stock within the next six months. The PSC views this new housing as an essential piece of an overall solution to homelessness in Humboldt County, but the PSC encourages the city to continue to sponsor additional supportive housing development as the city's homeless population continues to expand and housing becomes increasing, increasingly scarce and out of reach. The PSC also commends the city of Arcata for its recent allocation of and I don't know what this is, CDBG funds to expand homeless services by shoring up Arcata House Partnerships walk up and street outreach programs as well as Cooperation Humboldt's street outreach program. This funding is providing much needed support to address the day-to-day -day needs of people experiencing housing and food insecurity. Nevertheless, the PSC considers the development of a day use center and navigation center is critical to the successful engagement of those in most need of services and essential for alleviating the impact of homelessness on businesses and residential communities. For this reason, day use and navigation services remain one of the top priorities for the PSC in the coming year. Of particular note, the PSC applauds the City of Arcata for its groundbreaking launch of Humboldt County's first safe parking program in collaboration with our Arcata House Partnership earlier this year. Despite experiencing early safety issues associated with unpermitted campers outside the safe parking program, this project has stabilized and now appears to be operating with almost no negative impact to the community. Although a one-year pilot program the PSC views this program as filling a crucial gap in short-term services by effectively increasing immediate sheltering op options for people living in their vehicles. The PSC strongly urges the City of Arcata to seek funding to continue and expand upon this program beyond the first year as the numbers of people living in vehicles and alternative shelters appears to be increasing almost exponentially. This program, in, con in conjunction with support for other forms of short-term and long-term shelter, are essential for providing immediate relief for the, from the negative impacts of homelessness while assisting individuals in stabilizing and ob obtaining permanent housing. Although the City of Arcana has made many important steps toward increasing services to individuals experiencing homelessness, homelessness remains at the forefront 
of community-wide concerns. Sufficient affordable housing remains elusive throughout the county, and the numbers of individuals facing unstable housing continues to rise. It is the opinion of the PSC that the city of Arcata must keep homeless solutions as a top priority for future planning, and homelessness retains its place as the top priority of the Public Safety Committee in the coming year. Our committee has re recommended in the past the MIST program be instituted in Arcata. It has evolved over time to now independently working without an officer present unless needed. We also continue to advocate for more MIST clinicians and we support their cooperation with Arcata House Partnership. Additionally, we support the addition of the 988 phone answering service to our community and look to it as an additional tool for our ambassadors and public service officers to use. Future goals. Well, I, I'm looking here and I'm, I'm thinking I must be missing a paragraph. But I, I'm going to, I'm just, okay, if it's here, just know that I'm going to end with that because I think it's of note. Future goals. As we look to the future, there are many opportunities for our committee to serve our community. Our first task will be to review what we've accomplished and looking at the, the police budget and where the money is allocated, that's going to be pretty easy. We need to have our members involved and aware of the problems and changes that are happening in our community. They are happening so rapidly, it's really difficult. I don't know how you are keeping up with it all, honestly. We want to work with and partner with other city committees such as transportation and planning. Cal Poly Humboldt has a public safety committee and has invited us to attend their meetings. Because of the North Town footbridge and crafts of small projects are intended to make our streets and walking paths safer, we would like to become involved with our city's new commitment to the implementation with the complete streets policy for the city of Arcata. The policy directs the city to direct the design, construction, reconstruction, repair, and maintenance efforts on the city's roadways, bridges, pathways, sidewalks to create an integrated transportation network that is safe, accessible, comfortable, accommodating, and welcoming to all users. Our po homeless population is a priority for our community, and we appreciate all the effort that this council has expended to create two new housing facilities with social services into being. The relocation of the homeless community in Carlson Park to new housing and the creation of a new park will create our city's first river park. The creation of the new car park is already providing much needed help for those who have been living in their vehicles. Okay, this is what I was missing. Okay, the next. The new ambassador program with the assistance of Arcata House is our first effort to improve public safety without having armed officers. Check that off. That's the first in Humboldt County. And we applaud you for that effort. Uh, we are excited to see these efforts develop and mature. We have an opportunity to recognize other community organizations and individuals who are also helping to make our city safer. In the past, these organizations and individuals have provided cold weather shelters, and they continue to house the homeless and feed the hungry. They provide, they provide counseling, gardens, meals, clothing, and a helping hand. Integrating them into the system will give us more options for solving the problems our community faces. Our community has been focused on our city's provided services. In our city, we can be served by many community agencies we call 911. Besides the Arcata Police Department, we see every day that the County Sheriff's Department, Cal Poly Police, California Highway Patrol can and do help police our community. As Cal Poly hum Humboldt expands into the city, we will see them patrolling university-owned properties. If we need a first responder, it will most likely be a member of the Arcata Fire Department, headquartered in McKinleyville. We will need to monitor how and, 
and to whom they are responding. Our community's future goals include focusing on public safety in our business areas and neighborhoods. We will continue to work in the North Town and Valley West. We will continue with our efforts concerning nuisance abatement, problems with parties, and graffiti. The committee continues to monitor the police reform, policy review, and attentions to our neighborhood's public safety concerns. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Wonderful. Thank you, Fred, um, for that very thorough, excellent report and for all the work that the committee does. I mean, just seeing this, this report right here, we know how much you guys are doing. Um, do we have any questions or comments from the council? Oh, I just wanted to tell you what those initials stood for, and so you'll know where the, okay. money, where the, money, where the money came for the housing. Yes. And that's the Community Development Block Grant Program. Thank you. And so that's, you know, then you thanked us for that, and this is where the yeah. funding came from. And also, I just read that um, they're going to be probably op reopening the Mad River uh, Fire Station. Yes, so, they are. So that that's another. They have, they got, uh, you know, it's funny how things happen when you're walking around town, ran into a fire fire uh, person on, on Friday and talked to him because my person I was going to have a, a talk with was, it was late. So he explained the whole thing to me. And we also discussed uh, for you know, just for your you know the the ladder trek, and the question I have is if it takes sixty feet to deploy a fire truck along the street, how much space does it take to deploy a ladder truck? So you know I think uh, we have not commented on the gateway project. Uh, it seems like we have too many goals. You have a lot going on. Yes. For sure. And it's not that there aren't issues that we would like to to deal with. But we're only five years in existence. And if we are able to get to work with other committees, we're going to make more connections and we're going to be more effective. So uh, I'm hoping that's what we're going to be able to work on this year. Well, so, I mean. I have Thank to say you. I'm excited that you're thinking about the uh, crossing, the bridge that goes across the freeway. Yes. And um, you haven't walked that, and you have to walk it at night to see how much light there is on there. <laughs> and that's always been an issue is is the lighting. Yes. And um, people would take markers and they would mark out the lens so it would be dark. They did. Uh, they do. And so I'm thinking that something that. Caltrans, we really need to figure out the lighting system on that and how that could be a made in something that would provide more light. It's not going to bother cars driving underneath no. it and just to have more light on that. I'm also ex always have been thinking about what fun it would be to have some kind of a graphic that would be on the base of it. Of course, we know that down at the Playhouse, they have to repaint every so often. I think Jackie's here somewhere. And uh, I could see you when you came in. But I think that that's a, a really a good idea. It, it make it more fun, a place that you could talk about and visit. Right. And I know that's mentioned in, in uh, Melissa's report. And we spoke today. And, and one of the things we talked about was graffiti. And you know we would like to deal with that and thank you to our police department who is now sending out letters to abate the the nuisance of graffiti it's been interesting in the last two weeks since the university got going the additional graffiti but that's what it is so um, but I was going to say it you know the the driving through Eureka today they just finished a project underneath the bridge and it's absolutely gorgeous and I totally agree with your suggestion. Okay. So the the other thing I think is an issue. I don't know if this would be your issue, but it's an well, issue in Arcata is the free boxes. And yes. we we see those free boxes around. And my feeling about a free box is this okay if I talk about this? It's part of I think public. It ends up in our waterways. It ends up in our beaches. We have we people that have these uh, free boxes. They either can go to Arcata House, they can go to um, the hospice place and see if they can give their things away. If mm -hmm. they have them, if they put them out at 8 in the morning, they need to bring them in by 6 at night. And if nothing's gone, it needs to go into the trash. And then it'll keep it from, 
and all these campgrounds and everywhere we find it and that's a lot of work for city staff to continually clean it up it takes away from other duties so I, I just I don't know how if you even talk about that but that's we haven't point. talked about that but in my name I can just tell you we have uh, let's see we have two small libraries which you know the many libraries that are in boxes mm -hmm. we have two of those in our neighborhood we have one person who has taken a an old uh, newspaper con a rack container that's now being used to provide food for the homeless and we have boxes that are put out constantly and I think that they, the the idea is that it's for to help our homeless community well they it it does for it a is. period of time and then you have to right. take it pick it up and take it away I right. mean that's what they've been doing at Carlson Park the cleanups and yes. it's amazing the amount of items that have look like they could have come out of a free box but well, thank you very much I don't yes. to keep you no, any no. longer I mean, we could we could have a nice conversation yes, about could, this we? <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Great. do we have any more questions from anybody I saw folks writing stuff down no okay okay I thought you thought you might yeah. Yeah. yeah oh good yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so yeah uh, what's been reported to me by community members that um, attend your meetings is that you know while you know, I think all of our committees are really dedicated, really hardworking. Um, you know, I've heard the ex opinion expressed more than once that you are the hardest working committee in the city and that you're incredibly wow. dedicated. Um, you are the most uh, committee member driven committee. Um, and for that, I'm really grateful. I think it sets a really good example for what's possible from our committees and the, the dedication from our community members. So thank you very much. Um, I've also heard positive feedback <clears throat> about city manager Deemer's attendance at the meetings, uh, making sure that the community was aligned with council goals. So I really appreciate that as well. Um, and yeah, you know, they did bring us some recommendations. Um, I think they make sense. Um, and I think that, yeah, you know, it, we should consider uh, supporting those recommendations and moving them forward. Um, and, and then I did have a question for Chief Ahern, um, if he was available. Um, and then while he's coming up, um, I'll share it with him with the uh, the podium. Yeah, I'd be happy then, to. Uh, <laughs> um, if, is it all right? Yeah, I mean, I mean the glare though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So. So right now, is it? Is it? It's like we have about three on-duty officers at any given time. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So yeah, you know what I. What I come back to is, well, first, you know, it's finding this balance between, um, you know, spending the appropriate amount of money on, I think, essentially, you know, armed law enforcement versus, uh, you know, other people that do more types of intervention work that um, don't need to carry a firearm. I think that's, to me, that's what it kind of essentially comes down to. And <clears throat> I feel like the baseline, you know, need that I just always want to make sure we have addressed is, uh, you know what we saw happen with the, uh, the tragic murder of Josiah Lawson and um, you know from the police foundation report the findings were real real you know there were a lot of things that went wrong but I think one of the big findings was that we did not have enough resources available to get on the scene right away to you know do crowd control to protect the evidence um, you know things like that and I understand we have all you know some really good mutual aid agreements and we have you know really good um, partners in, uh, in law enforcement um, but you know, it doesn't seem like anything can really replace that. Uh, you know, the value of having our own, you know, officers, I guess, be more immediately available. Um, and so, I mean, in my mind, you know, I feel like it would be reasonable to provide funding to where we had at least four officers on duty at any given time. Um, I mean, that's just you know, just kind of along those, along that line of thinking. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, do you have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, I think we've, you know, Arcata has really done a good job in the last few years striking a, the appropriate balance. Um, the, uh, the foundation report and our own um, analysis certainly identified some areas that we needed to improve on. For example, um, uh, this city and our city manager working with our personnel department, you know, created a job description for a civilian evidence technician position, which we didn't have. Uh, the night that Josiah uh, was murdered. So, you know, that person rolls out with our investigative division now. And back then we didn't have an investigative division. So now we have a, a sergeant 
and two detective positions, one of which is staffed right now. The other one we promoted to the outreach position because that's a, that's a high priority of this council in this city you know, as well. I don't think anyone um, discounts the value of what an armed police officer brings to any scene, but certainly as soon as you triage it and realize that the tools and the skills they bring are not necessarily needed if you have the, the non-sworn element that has the expertise to then transition the problem to them, it's certainly the most practical thing to do. The other thing uh, specifically about how many officers are on duty at one time, this council and prior councils have been very supportive of um, finding additional monies uh, to um, perhaps uh, add to our existing staff. Problem is, we're having a real difficult time identifying and locating people who want to join not just the Arcata Police Department, but law enforcement in general. But again, I will credit our city manager and this council for finding the money that will enable us and is enabling us to go out on the road and recruit. We're having some success with that. We're very appreciative of that. But our staffing right now, you know, uh, we are, we're four below um, our budgeted staffing. We've got a couple of officers that are looking for opportunities outside of, of Arcata simply for family reasons. Um, so we realize that recruiting, retention uh, is going to be an ongoing need for the next several years. But just knowing that if we do identify those folks, that we have the support of this council, if we do come back um, you know, and ask for additional funds to perhaps meet or even exceed our budgeted staffing, given the tremendous challenges that we are experiencing you know, as a city, the, the potential growth, that, that's a good place for a chief to be at. So is there anything we can do you know, within reason to, you know, I guess, make it more enticing to work for the Arcata Police Department? Uh, so yes, I'll, I'll deliver four applications okay. to all, all right, of you right, right now, yeah. and uh, yeah. I can have to be backgrounded in the academies tomorrow morning. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's everywhere. Recruitment is very difficult, no matter where. And every day you read about it, and it's 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 not only police department; it's everywhere. So, I think until that all changes, I think COVID had a, a big significance causing this and there's a whole different thought process that's going through my, people's minds now that we've had COVID and they had a different experience. So I don't know what kind of incentive unless you want to go to work for the police department. Well, usually it's financial, right? You know, it's hiring, hiring bonuses and, and things like that. I think it's pretty common. You have to find someone that's, that's going to want to even do that. So I think we're, I think they're doing a great job and I really appreciate it. I see on your cars that you, you have availability right. for officers. I thought that was a great way to advertise. Right. And, and real, I, I just knowing that we have your support, um, with not only, you know, uh, with potential future additions to the organization, but the, the, you've allocated funds in the moment for us to go on the road and to really recruit here locally, you know, that that's part of our goal is to hopefully we can, we can, you know, our brand is appealing to many people right here in Arcata in Humboldt County, but the funds enable us to, to get back on the university campus down to CR, go to different academies, starting with Northern California, and just got our brand out there. You've, you've given us money to do advertising, which we've never done before we're advertising in trade publications we do have four people in backgrounds right now you know so it, it's working it does take time i don't know if there's anything else you can do um the fact that you support what it is we're doing as an organization the fact that you're providing us funds to continue to be a best practices organization then really to be honest with you it's up to me to get out there and find people to join our great police department and work for a wonderful city. Thank you, Chief. So, thank you. I just, you know, you bring up this one crazy thing. I'm going to say it's crazy. But years ago, when they didn't have enough jurors uh, for a trial, they'd go out and pick people off the street and they'd say, come on, you're going to be a juror today. You're going to be a juror. You're going to come that, that, in. That's called kidnapping, ma'am. Well, uh, that's, I think that's what they did. And they had to come in and be in the jury that day. But I don't think we can do that for police no, officers. No, I'll be in prison tomorrow <laughs> for that. So. Okay. Well, thank you, Chief. Do we have any more questions from council on the public safety committee report? 
So yeah, um, how's our crime rate looking in the city? Our crime rate? Yeah. Oh, you know, we're doing really well from a violent crime perspective. Very few call outs right now. Um, and, and, you know, factors are a lot of times demographic. Uh, property crimes, we're, you know, we're very similar to other uh, jurisdictions. You know, it's very difficult out there. Um, the economy is, is, is bad. And oftentimes, some people resort to stealing property that others have worked very hard to attain. So, uh, you know, that is a difficult challenge, certainly not one we're not willing to continue to chip away at. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if I had to choose one or the other, I'll take a property crime over a person getting assaulted any day of the week. However, we, we need to continue to work on that, educate people, emphasize the need to really care for your own property without victim blaming, right? Everyone should be able to go to sleep at night with your windows open and your doors unlocked and your car windows down, right? That, that is an expectation of any civilized society. Unfortunately, you know, we've learned as a country and as a world that you're probably gonna lose some of that property. But it's not your, it's never the victim's fault. So we still have a lot of work cut out for us, but I would say um, Arcata continues to be a very safe city. Um, and that is a good place to be, especially as we welcome our university community back. We're, we're coming back from COVID. We've got some tremendous plans evolving as a city. So, you know, we, we're progressing well. We're trending well from a crime perspective. Great. Thank you. Uh, my last question is maybe for Karen. Um, so some of the research I've seen shows that communities that have more access to mental health services. Uh, there can be correlations between lower crime rates and also um, lower rates of homelessness. Um, and you know, I I understand we you know we work with MIST and they help us out and stuff. Um, but how much like you just like you know a rough estimate? Do we as a city spend on mental health services for the community? Um, I would have to probably get a little more definition on the question. You know, our MIST as a direct allocation is probably a, probably trending at about 90,000 a year right now. That's direct outreach and street outreach services. Um, I would consider a lot of the programs that are operated through our parks and recreation divisions to also be uh, mental health programs. On the prevention side, we have our juvenile diversion program uh, that does a lot of direct work with mental health services with youth in our community. So, I mean, we could put together a, a number of what we think would capture that, uh, but still the direct one-on-one -on -one service with the exception of MIST and the exception of the juvenile diversion programs that actually do mental health counseling. Uh, you know, most of that service is still provided at a county level and funded by the state at a county level. Thanks. Well, to follow up on that, it's not our a city's job is not to provide those kind of services. It's, may, it's what's happened over the years as far as homeless services and so forth. We've had to step up the plate and do that. But the county is the one that is organized around that. They have the mental health services, as I'm sure you know that. So thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know that it's if it's the city's job or not. I haven't really seen any um, state policy or anything that that says that but I think it is something you know that's important to the community again there is evidence that shows it can you know help with crime rates and um, homelessness and um, so yeah just maybe in a future goal setting session it'd be something worth taking a look at um, I think well, let me just double check really quick so are we maybe while, while we're double checking uh, yeah, let's see if we have any uh, members of the public waiting to comment on this item anybody here in person wishing to comment on the Public Safety Committee report or if there's anybody online. Um, I don't see anybody online. I did just want to update uh, Council Member Stillman. We, oh, we've got somebody coming to the podium. Okay, while you're walking up there, uh, we did a pretty large replacement of the lighting system on the walking bridge. I'm not going to call it perfect, uh, but it is, I'm going to say, 100% better than it was. <laughs> uh, and we will continue to work to improve that. And the council did budget in the uh, GNH Green and Gold Corridor. There is 10,000 that is set aside of funds to support the bridge project. There is a, a bridge group that's working, uh, both with the Public Safety Committee, uh, Playhouse Arts, and they're connected into Equity Arcadas Just Starts with Jim Wolgum from the Cal Poly campus. Great, okay, public comment, go ahead, sir. My comment is, uh, I've lived in a lot of cities, and um, this is one city that interesting, I've never seen anybody pulled over 
um, for violations for speeding and I've noticed that there we have we have a problem there and and I don't see really action happening there um, you know this is a leading uh, indication of people being injured or, or killed I mean that that's the, the staff the data on that is pretty overwhelming um, you know and it's it's kind of not only speeding it's also you know somebody like myself who rides a bike a lot there's a lot of people that are driving and they're doing drugs too at the same time um, you know and and you can get a lot of data from the insurance industry on things like texting too so I don't think the streets are that safe regarding those and, and we're spending a lot of time and money talking about the gateway and what we're going to do with bicycle routes and into the future and I know a city such as Davis who is probably about 40 years ahead of us as far as setting up you know safe lanes and st stuff for bicycles and paths um, you know and that's a huge university town with a lot of students um, that's a big part of it but the other ha half of it what Davis does is you know I, I know people who live there if you're speeding in Davis you're gonna get a ticket if you're doing drugs driving you're gonna get a ticket if you're texting you're probably a good chance you're gonna get a ticket so that is part of um, the strategy here and uh, that's my my guess at it but maybe you could provide the data from the police department on that because um, I like to see whether there has been people being stopped for those and I mean it's right in front of where I lived um, 25 mile an hour speed limit car flipped upside down right there so uh, it's just amazing how things that are happening that we're sort of not addressing um, you know we kind of we address it by saying we want 25 mile hour speed limits but we're not really looking at some of the evidence that's giving us clues that what's going to happen in the future when our population grows from Cal Poly from the Gateway Project there's going to be a lot more cars thousands of cars and there's going to be a lot more people on the streets and especially after what was asked tonight as far as um, how many officers we, we have um, you know it, it, I, I, I'm hoping to be more optimistic about it but it does, doesn't seem like we're going to have a really safe environment in the future without a, addressing these issues so thank you thank you Okay, any more final comments from the council on this one? Okay, great. Uh, at that point, we will move on to item number six on our agenda, which is early oral communications. Um, the city council values, values your comments in this 15 minute time period, allows people to address the council on matters not on the agenda. Uh, pursuant to Brown Act, the council cannot discuss or take action on items that are not listed on our posted agenda. At the end of oral communications, the council may respond to statements. Supported requests require that require council action will be set for future agenda or referred to staff. Speakers are limited to two minutes, and there will also be time for public comment specifically on each agenda item and again at the end of the meeting listed under item 12. Um, so please make your way to the podium if you have one of those numbers. Um, and now, if you are on Zoom, is a great time to raise your hand or press star nine. Um, and so we will begin uh, with two minutes for these folks. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Dandenau, and I'm the Executive Artistic Director of Playhouse Arts. And we've just heard Playhouse brought up a little bit today, dealing with public safety and what Playhouse Arts brings to um, the community. We've been working with the Public Safety Committee on the Bridge Project. We've been working with Equity Arcata. We've been working with getting um, artists in schools. Um, we've been working on many fronts within the community, and I wanted to um, direct something to you about the Gateway Project. Um, I was ecstatic to see the um, Playhouse and the Creamery District photos well within the strategic, uh, the, the, uh, the Gateway Project and um, excited to see the arts so present in that project. And what I'm proposing and my proposition to Council is that there is some funding allocated for arts in Arcata within that strategic um, the gateway plan. Uh, I see parks uh, have a stipend and a, and a, a possible uh, financial benefit from the gateway project and I think it's essential that we support the arts in that project and that we try to control gentrification. 
because that's what happens in arts districts. The artists come in, they make it groovy, they make it cool, they have a vision, then they get driven out. Um, and I think that it's a chance for Arcata to really redefine that and say what are the strategic objectives within the Creamery District? How do we make sure that artists are supported, not only with um, affordable housing, but um, happenings that the developers don't just put up a sculpture and say yeah see I supported the arts but there's a fund there so that artists can decide what they do with that money and so that's my provocation for you today and I'll be sending a little letter as well but I thought I'd come today say thank you for everything that you do for your service to the community and uh, you'll probably hear from me again Thanks, Jackie You're welcome. <clears throat> Here we go. My name is Joanne McGarry, and I kind of think that uh, it would be nice for all of those um, speaking to actually say their name. It happens at other uh, public forums, and sometimes, you know, us regulars uh, think everybody assumes they know who we are, but I'm introducing myself tonight, and we'll try to continue to do that so that I can know who's talking and what they said so that I can maybe follow up with them. So I just wanted to say that. But secondly, I wanted to... Um, show you a, an old sign that I carry around with me. I repurpose and recycle and reuse my signs and uh, we've had some hot weather th today and uh, three years ago as I continually remind you the city of Arcata did recognize when the United Nations was having the climate summit in 2019 about um, you know the climate reality and the urgency and the potential you know crises that we are um, facing in terms of climate as it applies to many local and municipal and community-wide issues locally. But then I'm going to end my uh, presentation or my talk at, this, at the beginning of this meeting about the THC and the CBD um, ideas I brought up before because I want to remind all of us in this room listening and out there that the THC means for me transparency, trustworthiness, um, and truth. And the H is humility, humaneness, and honesty. And the C means caring, compassion, and confidence or committedness. And then the CBD, we got um, compassion and bravery and um, decisiveness. So those are my um, drugs of choice that I share with you again because that's what this community needs and especially I want to talk about the tea transparency thank you thank you Joanne Gregory Daggett good evening um, last week I emailed you uh, the staff and the City Council information regarding um, environmental justice and urban planning so I don't, I don't recall this ever being brought up, but there was quite a bit of information regarding that. And regarding the Gateway Project, when I look at that, um, you, I see potentially the same issues and mistakes that were done in the last seven, 70 years in urban planning. You have cars coming from the north that are getting off at sunset, and basically we're talking about potentially thousands of cars coming from that direction. Um, we also have additional traffic coming from the south. Um, so it, it doesn't seem like this plan in the gateway is addressing that at all. It seems like it's just making the same pro mistakes in the past and setting us up as all like human guinea pigs as far as air pollution and, and basically noise issues. The other part of this that email was addressing environmental concerns and one of them that I pointed out was NOAA with a direct link to showing what the the wastewater treatment plant would look like at, in two to three feet, feet of uh, seawater and basically this is an issue that you're you're addressing from the standpoint of your voting on the barrel district and so you're making a big mistake by actually not saving that site for the future because that's been identified as the future site for the wastewater treatment plant. There's also quite a few letters from, from Humboldt State University addressing this issue with environmental science instructors that have uh, PhDs in this that are saying don't do that. And on top of that, our own staff from the past 
in 2016 has addressed this by having your the engineer saying that it'll be underwater and also the fact that David Loya even said that the future of Arcata is inland. So the question is, why are you heading towards the bay with all this information? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Fred Wise. A um, few things, I have a new, some new web pages just for the city council, it's just arcata one slash council, arcata1.com slash council. Uh, there's pages of links and information that I thought might be useful for you. Uh, for example, there's a page, uh, there's 14 letters that were received regarding the advisory committee. Um, uh, they're listed there, you can look at each letter separately and I made a two sentence summary of each letter so you can skim the whole thing in about five minutes or less. Uh, there are maps and aerial views of L Street and photographs and diagrams for if that's helpful and if there's other things that you want to see please contact me. Uh, second item is the, the surveys. Um, we acknowledge that the Slido surveys were not uh, valid and for a variety of reasons but they're still referred to which I think is improper. Uh, there was a survey done at the January open house. Um, uh, in April, I volunteered to set up a group to compile that. That information still has not yet been compiled. A local citizen compiled it. It was pretty time consuming for her. Uh, according to what she found, the number of people who wanted four stories or less was 64. The number of people who said eight stories was okay was zero. I disagree with her findings, I think that there are about two, said eight story. Regardless, I think you know, I've gone on record that uh, the building height should not be a popularity contest. It involves actual planning. Um, in terms of the uh, survey that was done a few weeks ago, it was not possible to enter duplicates. I looked at the raw data, I did some investigation on that. Uh, the Slido survey, on the other hand, you can enter as many times as you want. Um, thank you. Thank you, Fred. Okay, so we took our first four here. I want to check on, on Zoom. Okay, there's, there's three on Zoom. Okay, we'll take one more here and then move to the Zoom comments. Okay, I have some uh, items I'd like to pass out, if that's okay. I'm a little concerned, like uh, Mr. Weiss here, that our letters aren't getting in the agenda packet. So. Oh, sorry. And um, this is from the North Coast Journal about the, uh, the fire department and uh, their uh, problems with responding to fires right now and that we um, they don't even have a ladder truck that you guys are going right ahead steamrolling ahead talking about six seven eight story buildings and um, you know I was for eight story buildings when th the plan first uh, was proposed because I was thinking on the lines of equity and my mind got in a certain groove and I thought uh, we can just trade affordable housing for more uh, for higher stories, you know, but I, I'm right now I've just totally done a 360 degree turn and I think we need to start thinking about somebody mentioned to me the wastewater treatment plant and then I started thinking about a whole bunch of things, you know, like wetlands, how does it affect the ecology, how does it affect um, uh, our wastewater treatment plant, the fire, um, there are so many issues and so many impacts, and I don't feel like you're getting um, you're getting uh, all the feedback you need, and that's why we need an advisory committee, and that's why we're asking for it because even the community community isn't getting this feedback, and we deserve we deserve to know what the impacts are going to be, and we deserve to have answers, and that's why we want an advisory committee. Please reconsider that. And um, let's see. sorry, I'm a little nervous today. But um, also, I think uh, we are trying to get a survey together. You, that survey that you conducted with the form-based code, uh, the August 16th meeting, that was a joke. That was like 30 to 50 people. Thank you're you not getting a, you're not getting That's a cross section of people, and you really need that. And so okay. we're Thank asking you, for that. We'll Thank you. Another section at the end. Um, okay. We're going to move to our Zoom comments here. All right, our first uh, online comment is James. Go ahead, James. Uh, hello, can you hear me? 
we can it's a little echoey so i'll turn it down a little yeah we had we had two we're down to one thank you um and as no surprise i'm going to speak to the l street corridor uh the early december 21st release of the gateway draft is when the community first began consideration of the future l street corridor and what its future represented since that point it's become apparent through the um, it's become apparent that the road will pave over open spaces. At this point, I wonder if community members were asked and informed, do you support the L Street Linear Park, enhancing a class one trail through the intended purpose of rail banking, expanding its footprint, and by absorbing easements from the North Coast Rail Line, an easement that is in the hands of the Great Redwood Trail. The city of Ukiah has already supported a community-backed linear park along with its rail banked Great Redwood Trail Line. A linear park on L Street will preserve wetlands that are already identified by California Fish and Wildlife and active breeding frog habitats. Or do you support a through road that will increase noise, congestion, and pave over open spaces? So much discussion has been about the gateway infill will preserve open spaces in the forest and the bottom plan. The L Street linear park is the preservation of open spaces for the community that will grow in this future infill. Upon completion of the Great Redwood Trail, travelers will share in the appreciation for the common green belt that will enhance Arcata as a whole. Through the actions of rail banking, the entire rail line from Alliance to Samoa Boulevard can become a blank slate for further possibilities for recreation and landscaping. I ask you to honor the intent of rail to trails, not rail with trails, and definitely not rail to roads. Please honor the, honor second, the August 2nd recommendation of Transportation Safety Committee for the L Street Linear Park as a park that prioritizes people. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. I feel like you time it and practice it like right before. You're always right on time. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, on to the next comment. Our next speaker is Duria. I hope I pronounced that right. Go ahead. Yes, you pronounced it right. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Durya Sayed, and I'm an outreach analyst. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, because the timer did not go, so I was, you know. So, okay, my name is Durya Sayed, and I'm an outreach analyst for the Department of Insurance. I work in Community Relations and Outreach Branch, and I just wanted to give you an update on the work we have been doing on your behalf. It's a wildfire season, so I want to touch bases on that, that we have a safer from wildfire fires framework and interagency partnership between Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara and the Emergency Response and Readiness Agencies in Governor Gavin Newsom's administration. And its purpose is to protect lives and businesses by reducing wildfire risk. We are working with Cal Fire, Cal OES, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, and Public Utilities Commission. So uh, just wanted to bring it up that it's a ground up, up approach uh, for wildfire um, uh, resilience approach has three layers. We call it SFW, one, two, three plan. Number one, protect the structure such as making sure your roof and vents are up to date. Number two, the surroundings such as brush too close to your home or any flammable items stored under your deck. And number three is the community involved with entire community to prevent wildfires from catching and spreading. And I have good news today because it is today that Commissioner Lara submitted this insurance pricing regulation to the California Office of Administration Law that would be recognized and reward wildfire safety and mitigation efforts made by homeowners. So basically that's what it is. It will take 30 days and uh, for the administrative law to determine whether the proposed regulations satisfy the requirements and we are hoping that it will the whole process will be done by 2023. I just wanted to come um, and uh, tell you that I am your outreach analyst. Any problem with auto insurance, homeowners insurance, wildfire, any insurance problem that you or your constituents are having, we are here. We are so proud to tell you that we have live chat and if we don't answer your call, our call back time is two minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is call-in user two. Go ahead, call-in user. Oh, you're still muted. Can you unmute? Call-in user. Go ahead and unmute. Hello, thank you. Zoom is not very user-friendly for a telephone. 
Uh, my name is Andy, and I'm just calling very briefly to tell the council that I'm calling to support and give my appreciation for Council Member Watson. Um, I believe that it takes a lot of courage to work through mental health issues, and while he certainly made poor choices that have been well documented, the fact that he's able to take steps needed for recovery and continue his duties in the city and always working for the marginalized communities in Arcata, I believe is pretty admirable. And I just feel that it's in poor taste, and I felt it had to be said after last week's meeting that Mr. Watson's past transgressions are constantly mentioned when he provides some relevant input to a council issue. And that's all. Thank you for your time. Okay. Is that the last of our comments yep. on Zoom? Okay. And I think that rounds out our 15 minutes as well. Okay. Um, next, we are going to go to the consent calendar. I have a couple of quick comments on the public comment. Yep. Um, I'll keep it quick. Um, yeah, I just want to address uh, Joanne's comments uh, really quick about asking commenters to say their name. Um, I believe that uh, it's against the law to actually require people to do that. Um, that's my understanding. So, um, and yeah, you know, I think it's it's mixed. You know, it is nice to be able to identify people, but you know, I think we've seen a lot of times too that we can sometimes when people express. Gosh, I thought we weren't supposed to comment on people when they came and talked to us. That we didn't get into a dialogue. And it's our choice. I'm not getting into a dialogue. I'm just making a comment. It's our choice. I didn't think we could respond yeah. to them from the dais. So yeah, I must have misunderstood, but I would think that was it what we were saying. The text. I mean that you know. Yeah. we can discuss not discuss but if there are any final comments or things that we would like to direct staff to put on a future agenda uh, we can make some quick comments yeah so um you know i just we have seen some some examples of people expressing their opinion and then you know they can sometimes get attacked by other people in the community um so f you know for that reason you know i kind of do support the just giving people the option i guess so they can kind of have that freedom and um you know not have that fear of being able to express their opinions um yeah that was it thanks on to item number eight consent calendar all my items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the city council and are enacted in one motion there is no separate discussion of any of these items if discussion is required the item may be removed from the consent calendar and considered separately at the end of the reading of the consent calendar council members or members of the public can request that an item be removed for separate discussion um, so we will begin. Item A, approve the minutes of the City Council meeting of August 3rd, 2022. Item B, approve the minutes of the City Council meeting of August 17th, 2022. C, bi biweekly report on disbursements. D, declare a continuation of the local emergency related to the coronavirus pandemic. E, adopt resolution number 223-17, a resolution of the City Council of the City of Arcata amending the class and pay resolution. International Union of Operating Engineers, local number three, to reflect new transit bus driver position and adjustment to maintenance worker salary ranges. F, award a contract in the amount of $714,917.16 to D GHD Incorporated to provide a preliminary engineering and environmental services necessary for the Sunset Avenue and LK Wood Boulevard improvement project and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. G, approve the purchase of one 2023 Ford Police Interceptor and one 2023 Ford F-150 Lightning Truck for Parks and award a contract to National Auto Fleet Group in the amount of $111,854.64, including tax, and allocate an additional $4,649.17 from 771 Central Garage Fund to cover purchase costs and authorize the city manager to execute all applicable documents. And finally, item H, approve an increase to the contract price for the city's purchase agreement with Golden Harvest Incorporated for fabricated slide gates and actuators in the amount of $10,339 to account for changes to the slide gates' specifications per the design engineer's recommendation. So would any council members like to remove an item from the consent calendar? I'd just like to remove item D and F, please. Mm -hmm. Um, are there any members of the public that wish to remove an item from the consent calendar or staff? Uh, nothing online. Okay. Great. So can we get a motion on the consent calendar yes. minus items D and F? I would move to approve all items except for D and F on the consent calendar. And second. Okay. So we have a motion by council member Stillman and a second by council member Matthews. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, motion passes unanimously. So uh, we will begin with looking at item D, declare a continuation of the local emergency related coronavirus pandemic. Councilmember Watson, you pulled that, what do, you, what do we got? Yeah, so I just wanted to quickly comment. Um, 
you know, I know part of this is making uh, our meetings more accessible to the public via Zoom or in person. It says COVID modification, meetings may be accessed by the public via Zoom or in person. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, I did, maybe um, you all did as well. This got a fair amount of feedback about the, um, the study session we had with the planning committee. Um, you know, I think a lot of people had the expectation, I mean, I would say a reasonable expectation that they'd be able to participate on Zoom or over the phone. So I think, you know, some people were disappointed about that. And then, uh, you know, we were assured that there would be a audio recording of the meeting available, um, but I didn't actually hear the audio re recording myself, but um, several people expressed, uh, you know, their discontent that the audio recording was um, not very high quality. It was hard to hear people. Um, you know, I, I think it was just kind of taken up, recorded on a staff member's phone on one side of the table. So people on the other side of the table, okay, oh, that's good. You can go for free to give me feedback. Um, so um, just, you know, if in the future, and I get it, we have limited resources, you know, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if in the future, you know, whatever we can do to, um, to make, uh, you know, the meeting more accessible or at least, you know, clear recording later. Um, and then somebody had even suggested maybe, and I don't even know if it, you know, makes sense, but um, to consider, you know, contracting with somebody maybe like Eric Black in the future, um, if our, you know, tech staff isn't available to record um, somebody that's kind of already there uh, making recordings. Um, that's all I had on that item. Could you clarify if you had more comments, Karen? Yeah, I know it's just that the sound, you know, it was a different format and style for us all sitting around the table and trying to capture that. Uh, we did put out basically, I'll call it the polycom. It's the, looks like a telephone without a handset. <laughs> and then we did actually purchase two extension microphones to try to spread the, you know, the depth of, of that table. But it is just very hard between background noise, how, um, amplified each speaker is to see how that would capture so um, I did listen to it you know most of it was was certainly audible uh, however it's hard and you, you can't see who's speaking to kind of put a name to a face and so it was a challenging environment but we'll continue to work to try to improve thank you so and, you're, and to you're to Joanne's constant point everybody needs to talk louder we're, we're up here we're in public let's talk louder so everybody can hear us too especially when we're being recorded for these meetings at home and everybody here i mean i think that's always important um okay do we want to move forward with item d do we have a motion i'll on move that? for um approval of item d second okay all in favor aye aye, aye. okay uh, and now moving to item f oh yeah yes okay do we have public comment on item d that was pulled uh none online yeah. No public comment on item D, so we'll move to item F. Okay. Um, yeah, is it is there like a picture available of this that we could just look at really quick? It was just hard for me to visualize it. I don't know if this has come up in the past. Um, is there a visual? Oh, visual of the proposed improvements? Uh, the yeah, best area. yeah, just what we're talking about, I guess. Um, uh, projects just improve includes the intersection of Sunset and LK Wood on the both sides and the Sunset and GNH improvements. So you want to see a picture of the area? We can put something on the screen. Well, I guess you know, um, it's just it was hard for me to understand because it was you know kind of you know surveys and um, more technical information at least to me. Um, so I, yeah, I was just trying to get a clear understanding of it. Like a, a picture would have helped. Um, and I guess just to clarify, like so that's kind of like a I don't know if boundaries is the right word, but where city and HSU. Um, jurisdiction kind of meet and what part is whose uh, does that make so, sense so this scope of work is to complete the project approval and environmental document for the project so we don't have the drawings for the future improvements if that's what you're looking for we will be analyzing that in this phase and we will develop drawings that we could bring to you for review so I would just like to ask a question because I wasn't here for goal setting and for a budget approval so was this part of goal setting and part of budget approval okay well you should know about that then i would think that, that would have for all of us not for me but for the rest of you on the council would be able to understand when these items are coming in uh, on our agenda for a consent calendar they've already been something that have gone through goal setting and they've gone through the budget process and finally now they're able to pull it together and have it come forward to us and so i know you ask questions about these each time and i keep thinking weren't you at goal setting and weren't you at budget i know i wasn't but. and just to add to um you know, 
we all know where Sunset and LK Wood is. We all know that's a horrible intersection. I think that was a goal of the council. This is just the preliminary engineering to say, we're gonna fix that. Let's find out what it looks like. Let's work with, you know, we're hiring GHG to do it and, you know, moving forward with that. And then eventually we'll see those specific, you know, project pictures like Netra alluded to. Yeah, and I just appreciate to have the space to ask any questions I want as often as I need to. Um, you know, I feel like that's pretty reasonable. I feel like I'm entitled to that as a city council member. Um, you know, representing my constituents, I just continuously, you know, we go through a lot of information. And, you know, it is pretty well known that I, uh, you know, do suffer from attention deficit disorder, which memory is part of that. You know, I've talked with you about that, Alex, and I've sent you links about it. Well, you've told um, me personally, but that's yeah. not something that I would know okay, of from so the other city. Do with the GHG, let's go to a motion, please. Uh, Thank you. I move for approval of item F. Okay. You for approval of item yeah, F. I don't understand what we're doing. And I'm just. I thought I was being pretty reasonable. I'm just really asking hey, hey, to get hey, a clear you picture you know, of what's going you on. You want to take a break and we can go out and talk about it? Sorry, I thought I thought you were a little clear after what I said. But, right, I mean, we're, we're talking corner, LK Wood, Sunset, where it all comes in. This is the preliminary moving forward to have an engineering study of what we are going to eventually make improvements to pedestrian bike roadway. I second Alex's motion. Okay, I still have questions that I feel like aren't being answered. Do you need more from me? I mean, could, would you please help me have a clearer understanding okay. of this project? So the scope of work includes to prepare the environmental documents that will help us to complete the final design. And the environmental document includes doing the survey, doing the initial design, looking where the right of lines are, and coming up with the design. So that's what we are hiring GHG to do. And since most of the project is in Caltrans right away, and we will be working very closely with Caltrans and Cal Poly Humboldt, so there will be a lot of coordination involved in the project. So we are not proposing any design at this time. This is just to finish the phase one, I we call it, in the design work is this is just to complete the environmental document. Yes, it does sound like a lot of money, but it does include a lot of technical studies that's required. Uh, for the project and this is in the Caltrans on state highway system so it needs additional technical documentation for their standards hence there's a lot of scope of work involved in here okay so I guess that you know kind of where I was coming from is yeah it's seven hundred fifteen thousand um, dollars so for it to just you know I don't see where it's you know sp specifying you know this study costs this much this study costs this much it's just kind of this lump sum with you know followed by you know technical information uh, we did receive uh, itemized cost if it was not included in the staff report but for all those tasks we have itemized costs also from ghd for each task that listed in the scope okay. of work normally we do include that in staff report right so i think that's why i'm confused was that Sorry. normally i feel like normally we do so that's just why i was confused yeah no i think normally you would see multiple bids but for this project we only received one bid so you do normally see multiple costs because you see the comparison of the bidders um, but in this case, oh, yeah, in we this only one. received one bid. So if it's available, could you know we please in the future just receive the itemized? Yes, list? definitely, and we can even send via email. Okay. After the meeting. Okay. Thank you very much. I move to approve the item. Great. Okay. So we had a motion and a second from uh, Councilmember Stillman and Councilmember Matthews. We do need to take public comment. Is there anybody that would like to comment on item F, in person or online? Uh, no one online. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you folks. Okay, with that, we move on from the items of the consent calendar to item 10, which is old business. Um, and so uh, A under old business is to review and make a determination on the request from Arcane Artists Incorporated to continue to extend the ending time past 10 p.m. for their 2022 Arcane Summer Fundraiser Series. Um, and can we have a staff port report from City Manager Deemer, please? Uh, yes, thank you. So this item has come back before you. Uh, this event, Arcane Artist had uh, proposed a series of summer fundraising concerts to benefit the promotion of local artists. And all of them were uh, scheduled on N Street between 8th and 9th Street. And you'll recall uh, that originally I approved their first event uh, with an ending time of 10 o'clock to kind of get a lay of the land and figure out how the space would work. Uh, and then the promoter came to the council to request a later time frame. They have subsequently held uh, two additional events. Uh, the first one, after the council's approval uh, to have events that would play amplified sound until midnight, 
and then uh, non-amplified or silent disco uh, until one o'clock. But the first uh, concert they held after that approval, they did end the music at 11.30. And then the second uh, concert, they ended the music uh, at midnight. Uh, on the first event, uh, dispatch did receive two calls of complaints. We spoke with both of those callers and they were general noise complaints, had a hard time sleeping. Um, on the second event, I saw a couple of emails that came into the council. Dispatch received eight calls that evening. Uh, again, tried to respond to each of those calls. I think I reached five of the eight uh, and the general sense was the noise complaint associated with the concert itself. Uh, so, and I, and several of you received uh, those complaints as well and requested that this item be brought back before the council for consideration. Uh, the event promoter uh, is here this evening to answer any questions and also submitted some kind of late blue folder uh, correspondence that uh, we also printed to have before you tonight. Can I ask a quick clarifying question? Yeah. That first event with the noise complaints, wasn't there another event going on at the same time? There was. The, the first event after the council's approval of the later end time, uh, there was also a private event that was held at the pub. And they had an outdoor DJ that night. Uh, and I would say having been on site sort of between 9 and you know, a little after 11, 11.30 that evening, uh, the music from the pub was pretty much exclusively heard, I'll say, east of the pub. And then if you were west of the pub, you know, you would have been influenced by uh, the End Street concert. Uh, the outdoor music at the pub ended about 10.40 that night. Uh, on that first one. And then during the second one, they did not have a competing outdoor concert event, so that was good for the neighborhood that night. Uh, I'd love to hear from Joe. If wants to. Um, yeah, I think it would be helpful, Joe, if you just wanted to go over kind of this information that you presented to us and just, you know, to hear the report of how it went in relation to what we have heard from the public as well. So thank you. Yes. Good evening, council members and staff. Thank you for uh, again, bringing us forward to talk about these outdoor events. Um, in, I guess in summary of what has happened over the past two after the first time that we came before you, um, we had a very positive response from, of course, event attendees. Uh, we had two direct contacts to me after the first event or during the first event uh, from residences in the nearby neighborhood. Uh, they had basically uh, said that the noise was a little too loud for them. So at which time, around 10.45, we turned the sound system down a little bit, which was during the headliner set. Um, of course, the artist didn't like that as much, but we wanted to try and appease the neighbors um, that were in the area. Uh, so that was kind of the, the only response that I had received directly from the neighborhood. Uh, they all have my phone number, at least as many of the ones that we canvassed hell, have my personal number. And I've also told Karen that she's free to give out my phone number to anybody who um, reaches out to her or you guys as well. Uh, so that's kind of like the negatives uh, that I've heard so far from the events. Uh, the positives, of course, we've had uh, an immense amount of artists uh, coming to the area. We have 80 local artists that were supported by these events. We've created 24 new uh, part-time job positions due to these events, which is awesome. We also have four full-time positions now available due to these events um, going later in the revenue generation. If you want, I can run down some of these statistics with you now that we've been able to gather some uh, data from these last two events, um, if you'd like me to do that. Yeah. Okay, um, so in terms of guest arrival times and in correlation to the request of the extension of the hours, so by 8 p.m. over the last two events, we've had about 15% of attendees arrive. So that's a pretty low number um, by 8 p.m. By 9 p.m., we had just under 30% had arrived, still a little bit low even at 9 p.m. By 11 p.m., we've had 80% of the total capacity arrive. And then by 12 p.m., about 98%, there's still a couple stragglers that came in uh, right after that. Uh, the highest revenue hours that we've seen at the last two events were between 10 and 11.30 p.m., uh, grossing 40% of the entire event's revenue. Um, we also have some noise monitoring, both at uh, 10th Street, kind of by Ironside Metal there, and then also by close to the pub up on 8th Street. Uh, the decibel readings that were taken at 10 p.m. over on 
uh, 10th Street, which is about a block and a half from the stage itself. We're between 24 and 28 decibels. Um, over on the 8th Street side, which is more of the walking side of the event, which is where the main entrance to the event is held, uh, they were 25 to 29 decibels, and that was at 10, 10 p.m. And it seemed to be affected mostly when people were walking and talking uh, near the actual receiver. Um, the feedback that we have received from the neighbors after the event, uh, the closest single family home, they have two children under the age of two, and it's located at the corner of 10th and N Streets. Uh, they reached out to me right after the event on Sunday morning, and they told me that it was a really cool event. Uh, her husband actually went and checked it out for a moment, uh, and then they have their kids that were able to sleep through it. So that is something that we were grateful to hear. Uh, I know that that's not in line with all of the community as well, though I know some, some of the sound travels in different ways, and we want to be able to address that. So I do have some couple things a little bit later here that I wanted to talk about in ways that we think we could address that. Um, the Arcata staff recreation member, one of them was there. They said that the event was well run and that the sound seemed to be in acceptable levels. Uh, I talked with two APD officers on site uh, that were down at the event, and they said that they received some noise complaints. Um, they said eight, uh, and that approaching the event, the sound wasn't noticeable until past the pub on 9th Street, um, is what they told me. Uh, so that's something we wanted to take into account as well um, when we were deciding what we want to bring forward to you guys as a possible solution for this. And uh, we kind of came up with a couple different things that maybe would be acceptable to the community um, in addressing the noise complaints. Uh, we would suggest to remove the silent disco portion of the event completely um, to encourage an earlier end time and people to, be, to leave the event uh, more readily. We also have partnered with the Jam for after parties so that there is a free entry for all event attendees to go to the Jam directly from the event to encourage no loitering or excessive noise in the area. Um, we also are suggesting a turn down of the music at 20% from 11.30 to midnight. So that's 20% of the entire decibel reading uh, right next to the stage um, to give it a little bit more of a quiet, quiet ending to encourage other people to leave. And if necessary, we would also uh, do a last call earlier. Um, 11.30 would be kind of a, a nice last call and people would be finishing their drinks and heading out naturally a little earlier so that we wouldn't have any of those late late night um, people gathering outside. I also want to touch on some further considerations uh, that we want to bring to you guys. Um, people are coming from all over, you know, larger cities right now, uh, especially students to Cal Poly. And we're looking to create memories. And a lot of these people have, have talked about that and how much fun they're having. And, and of course, you know, the smiles all around. And there's not a lot of places to do that. And to my knowledge, I don't think there's anything that's quite this unique in this community, uh, outdoor events, especially during the, the you know, the, the nicer weather. Um, and we are asking, of course, for that, that end time to continue. Um, nothing brands commerce uh, and return loyalty to this area like nostalgia. And I think that at the last council meeting, we appeared before you and you heard from event attendees, artists, other businesses, and staff alike, and how much we're bringing here to the community and offering this type of experience. Uh, we would like to continue to be a part of why people go abroad and tell their families, friends, and acquaintances about the time they're having here and, and why they love where they live. And I think that creating those memories is really important here. Um, also having these vendors, we have so many vendors out there and they're all getting to do that for free and that's a lot of exposure for local business, new businesses, and they're trying to launch their platforms and I think that this is a great opportunity for recognition for them as well. Do you guys have any other, any questions for me right now? Um, does anybody have any direct questions for Joe now? And then I think we should open it up for public comment before we begin our discussion of this. Um, but if anybody has any direct questions for Joe now is the time for that. It seems like in some of the correspondence uh, I received supporting it, there was a focus on, um, you know, keeping it later, uh, being a positive thing for the students mm -hmm. and, you know, the importance of that. Um, and it just put the idea in my head, you know, that I wondered if this would be a good opportunity for the community to partner with Cal Poly Humboldt and perhaps, you know, hold the event on campus. You know, you'd have a very, you know, targeted market there. 
we've actually looked at, yeah. at doing that with the campus in a partnership and we decided uh, to forego that um, and stay within the community I think that the location that we have identified is actually the, from a, an aerial view the the best location in within city limits um, and a lot of the attendees we have are actually not students. Uh, we run these summer concert series, and most of the time when we actually do them during the summertime, there aren't a lot of students around. So yes, we're continuing into the fall and these nicer summer months because we got a late start this year. Um, and most, most of the people that do attend are actually not students. But we are trying to reach that market and have them also be a part of these shows. And then I was also wondering, do you feel like since it's advertised as going to a later hour that, you know, it, it allows people to um, show up later and that maybe if it was advertised to going, you know, let's just say till 10, mm -hmm. that that would encourage people to get there sooner to be able to enjoy it. So uh, actually we've, in, we've seen a 35% growth in the ticket sales alone uh, since the first event. And I think that, that the first event was also very well advertised. And I think that, that part of that is that later in time and people feeling more comfortable to come to the events knowing that they are basically in two shows for the price of one because they're allowed then to go to the jam after party for those later night people um, that want to actually go out and enjoy their their till 2 a.m. experience or whatever they'd like to do. And so I think that's a big factor in, allow, in, in being able to have these events succeed is having that partnership with another um, later going place. Yeah, I think that you had mentioned that the reason that it was important to go after 10 was that was when mm -hmm. a lot of the service industry yep. gets off yes. of work, which I completely empathize with. Um, so um, I like the idea, and I'm definitely interested in public comment, I like the idea of um, you know, foregoing the silent disco. I think that's great that you have a partnership um, with the jam. I would suggest um, instead of turning the volume down 20% at 1130, would it be, would you be comfortable sliding it back to turning the volume down at 11 and then? I, I personally am completely comfortable with that. Uh, the people that would have something more to say are the acts that we're booking. Normally a headline act that we would book, which costs, of course, quite a bit of money to bring in from out of the area. Um, their agents are the people that I have to work with. And what and some of them require certain, certain levels of sound be um, above previous artists. So to turn it down during that headliner position uh, would potentially be troublesome and the reason I said maybe 1130 is what I was asking for is we can end the headliner at 1130 and then bring somebody kind of like a closeout artist to sort of help people exit the event um, for that little bit of time so having the headliner at the jam is, is not. It would uh, it would definitely be counterproductive to have the headliner at the jam when we would be essentially we're paying for that over there. So we would be losing a lot, and you'd potentially see these events stop completely. Uh, Alex had a question. Yeah. So um, one of the complaints I had, and, and I understand, is that hard bass, and you hear people mm -hmm. driving through town with their cars and their windows yeah. open, and you hear them thump, thump, thump. Yes. And that was um, a, na a couple of neighbors in that vicinity. Okay. Um, I asked them just to let me know how things were going, and that was one of the comments they made: is the bass is really hard and deep. And one of them went over to um, check it out. He's a musician himself. But okay. And so I, I think that probably is a disturbing factor, or it is in cars, and I, would, and I know it is in music too, but it's something that people like to play. Um, one potential mitigating factor we could uh, implement to avoid that, normally we set which the cabinet, the sub cabinets on the ground, uh, and that does help things, of course, travel. You can feel more of it. And if people are feeling that in their homes, um, which from my my walking, I wasn't um, aware of, of that portion, but we could lift them. I don't know them. if it's in their home, but okay. it's that deep beat mm -hmm. yes. that travels. Right. Uh, we could lift the cabinet off the ground so it wouldn't impact it as much the way that the sound travels. Um, Karen, do you have um, the times that the calls were made? 
Yeah, I'm a, I may not be down to the minute, but I think that our, uh, the bulk, let's just go to the last event when we received eight calls. I think the first one came in at about 10.30, 10.40. Joe, you and I went through this, and then mm -hmm. the last yeah. one came in right about 11.45. Yeah, it was so, what you said, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we got anything before 10.30, maybe 10.23, but that was the first. Okay, if nobody has any specific questions for Joe, I think we should uh, take public comment and then we can come back and have a discussion about this. Okay, okay. thank you. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so we are open for public comment. Um, you'll have three minutes and yeah, there's somebody waiting. So, so, so line up if you are ready and then come forward to the podium uh, and you can begin your three minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Catherine Waitchell and I have a copy. I drafted a letter that I can provide uh, for you. You're welcome. I live in the Greenview neighborhood and I have a home-based uh, business there. I've lived on Villa Way for 16 years. And uh, the gist of the letter, I, I won't read every bit of it, uh, but it's regarding this particular agenda item. It says, I do not want the council to allow amplified sound past 10 p.m. for the special event permit for this said event. Uh, the last paragraph says, <clears throat> the Creamery District is located southeast adjacent to established single-family residential Greenview neighborhood, which includes working families, young children, and elderly residents. Loud amplified sound past 10 p.m. disregards the rights of the community members who live work and contribute to the neighborhood and to Arcata. These are signatures from my neighbors and friends that live on Villa Way. And I was able to take a good portion of today off from my business to do this because it's important to me. It's important to my kids to have a regular established routine, which would include going to bed approximately by 11 o'clock at night and getting up at a reasonable hour. I think that it sets uh, an incorrect precedence for this type of outside activity past 10 o'clock in an established residential neighborhood with people that have roots. We're talking the people here that have signed this. They are young families that have moved to Arcata to try to continue the, the, the integrity of the neighborhood, of kids growing up on that street. Um, there's a retired teacher that's legally blind that already has trouble sleeping at night. There's a retired custodian that worked for the school systems for 30 years and above. They go to church, St. Mary's Church on Sundays by having to be forced to stay up till one o'clock to accommodate completely disregards the integrity of the community. Thank you. Hi, I'm not afraid to say that my name is Joanne McGarry and I live in the neighborhood where these concerts happen and the, it just so happens I've been away from that neighborhood on the nights of those uh, concerts so I haven't uh, personally experienced the noise. Um, as I suggested before, um, my m main concern is more about the after party um, noise um, on the streets and people getting into cars um, unsafely and and that and the like but I do want to uh, let you know that the night of the lantern ceremony which is um, when one of those events uh, occurred before the lantern ceremony I walked to I um, spoke to somebody at the concert and explained to them that we were having this rather quiet solemn ceremony out at the marsh and that I was concerned if the noise traveled um, you know it would sort of disrupt the the feel of the lantern ceremony and so this gentleman gave me his number and said you call me if um, you are hearing us at the lantern ceremony so they were very very attentive to that particular issue that particular night and it did not occur 
as far as I could hear um, at the lantern ceremony, and so I did not need to call. But um, I just want you to know that I very much appreciate they're very responsive to the needs of the neighbors and and others in the community in regards to things like that. So um, I hope to at some point be in the neighborhood overnight when the concerts are happening. I won't be there this weekend either, but um, I think we should experiment a little bit with this and um, see how it goes and revisit in the next season. So thank you. I would like to uh, address this from the standpoint of um, the engineering of it because you know you have two groups one that wants to have fun entertainment that seems to be where the the city's heading with the gateway project with a with an entertainment district and arts so um, this is like a learning experience for that I almost feel like I'm the only one that's lived in high rises and, and been in this environment so the way you do it is that you have a business district where you can you know outdoor activities is very important you even have that in the gateway plan but unfortunately you're putting your uh, that right under high rises and so uh, my advice is you're going to have a lot of conflict in the future and that's going to be a really a, a disaster from that standpoint so my advice is what a lot of cities have done is a business district they have outdoor areas they have a place for you know bands and young people to go that is going to create an environment that isn't going to be a conflict with a residential area and um, I think this is where you need to go so unfortunately that's not in your plan and I would also state that the New York Times um, addressed this in the last week from the standpoint because of COVID there was a lot of outdoor restaurants that were set up on the sidewalk with music um, and they reported that the residents above these these uh, restaurants that have the sidewalk entertainment there there are a number of lawsuits from these residents going after the the, the restaurants and the city because of this issue so you really need to um, plan for this in the future I guess this is what we call a learning experience from you know trying to work with with the entertainment aspect and then also I guess learning from the residents perspective so um, I don't know what to say because this is going to be a constant problem because in the future because we're going to have you know thousands of more people in town and it really needs to be thought well uh, planned well and engineered otherwise we're heading down to a lot of problems thanks Um, I just wanted to talk about this from a community standpoint as well. I know that we have a very well-rounded community here in Arcata that includes retired community, artists, and everything. And I just wanted to remind us of what the representative from Playhouse said when they spoke earlier, that it's wonderful. We have these amazing artists that come in and they improve our cities, but then we don't look after them and we don't pay attention when, you know, a job with 80 that helps 80 artists and has 24 part-time jobs is on the table. So I just wanted to remind us of that, that it's great to benefit from these artists, but it's also really good to take care of them. And we should definitely do that with um, this motion that we're thinking of. Thanks. Hi, um, I'm actually wasn't here tonight to comment on this, but since this is here, I uh, just came up while I'm sitting here, I wanted to uh, speak as a resident in the community who lives the closest to the music. Um, my family of five with a one-year-old baby has, was totally able to sleep and um, it didn't bother any of us. Um, I, for the baby, we just put him on the other end of the house and all of us who slept on the closest end of the house to the music were able to sleep. Something that we do like to sleep with normally is ocean sounds, just every day, whether or not there's something going on outside and it totally was comfortable for us. I also do agree with Joanna, um, a, a neighbor, <laughs> that um, the, direct, the manager, director, um, head of the event has always been really kind about knocking on the door, making himself available and has said the same thing, you call me. It's if it's too loud and um, my biggest concern is the same as Joanna's more just the safety of 
folks leaving inebriated a little bit later, um, and uh, he's been really responsive about anything we could do to support that. Um, in the past, there have been events right behind us with uh, the Haleashi adjacent property uh, where they've had events going on till midnight, and we have slept just fine with our small children behind it. For what it's worth, uh, we're the closest. I just wanted to speak on behalf of our experience, and I want to support the artists in our community, and there is kind of a large homeless problem that migrates along our street and as a resident that is affected by that every day I'm actually thankful that they're going to be bringing in music and artists and people who are there to celebrate and support the community versus having different traffic that's a little bit difficult for a family to have neighboring you all the time so I'm very excited about it uh, thank you Hello everyone, um, I was here last time and I wanted to come again and speak as a community member but also as a member of Arcane Artists and a member of the dance team. Um, I've lived here for a couple of years and I've worked full time in Old Town Eureka and I've gone to school but I have not found something like Arcane Artists that really gives me happiness and excitement and it's also financially supported me a lot and like I don't think I would be where I'm at without them um, and I do believe that there is a compromise to be met with the other community members and the complaints with noise but I also think there's a compromise to be met for these artists for these 80 jobs for these people coming out of the area and for all the traffic it's bringing in a good way and all of the money and revenue it's producing and continue letting us continue to bring this excitement and enjoyment to other people and inspire people and like it's really inspired me and even inspired me to go back to school for this sort of things people in school want to be a part of this it's really building something for are uh, this young community and for the older community so I really do think that it's worth reaching a compromise to make sure all the neighbors feel listened to and are not disturbed but that artists continue to can make a impact on this community and feel heard and feel taken care of I think it's definitely what arcade is about you know so thank you hi I'm Jonah I work with our game um, I just want to uh, go real quick, but I want to um, point out a couple of things. One, obviously, we understand um, in a community you always have to make compromises, and we take pride in the fact that we represent a very diverse group of people. And to do that, you have to compromise with each other. And um, you know, big ears and small mouths. You know, we like to hear everybody's input, and we're not trying to bully our way into anything. We want everyone to, to enjoy themselves, and we understand that some people aren't necessarily going to enjoy themselves, but we don't want them to feel inconvenienced or bad. And so um, we are open to compromise. I feel like every single one of these events we've done, we've gotten better, um, and, and we've opened up um, more people to the ideas. And so that's what we're continuing to try to do, and we'd like to have the opportunity to do that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, everybody gets uh, three minutes. We don't really allow the back and forth between our commenters. So we're going to go to Zoom now for our Zoom comments. If there's nobody else who has not spoken already in person that would like to speak. Okay. All right. Our first online comment is a call-in speaker. Go ahead, Colin. Uh, can you unmute Colin speaker ending in 2-4? Give it one more try. Colin speaker ending in 2 4. All right, we will come back to you. Hold tight. Uh, our first Colin speaker will be Patricia. Uh, go ahead, Patricia. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so um, I uh, spoke the last time um, when you, it was brought up to council um, to make the decision whether you should go to 1.30 um, or I know Karen De Deemer um, suggested to start out at 11 o'clock and um, push towards uh, and then see do those two next trial 
runs of, on the events and see um, if it should be going later than that. So my question, one of my questions is, is it going to be going past 11 o'clock from, or I guess you voted on 12. So is it gonna be going past 12 o'clock to the original 1.30 that they were requesting it being extended out to? Um, so, and I also wanna thank Karen. Um, uh, she got back to me after the August 6th event, knowing that I had some concerns. And to be honest, for me um, and our house, um, it wasn't that bad on August 6th. Um, I know you had a couple complaints and I think the people west from us definitely get more of the brunt. There's also, it was out competed by the pub um, event that ended around 10.30 that night. Um, so it was really kind of hard to tell. I can tell you um, on the event of the 27th, Alex is right, that base was super um, more prevalent um, than the concert before. Um, and I have never been, I know Brett reached out because um, after that concert, um, wanting to know what my feeling was on it. And at that point, you know, I wasn't going to speak because I didn't really feel like I would, I would be heard, but I think I needed to voice up, um, especially for the people that are west from us in that neighborhood. Um, I know they got the brunt of it. I've talked to people that live out there and it was definitely really disturbing for them. I have to say the after hour party of everybody disturbed, um, dispersing was very disruptive um, on that um, that same concert um, on the 27th. So um, I, I just really, I guess, you know, I guess I, maybe I just need you to, you know, I request that before you make the decisions and allow, um, you know, the next five concerts to go on, it sounds like they have plans to go next summer and starting earlier. Um, I ask you um, to, when you make these votes, think of your loved ones and your family, your grandparents, your best friends, you know, the first responders that live in that area. And how would you vote if, if those people, you know, that you know and love live there? And um, let me gently um, remind you that you are responsible for the well-being of all of Arcata neighborhoods and the citizens and the citizens and you know you have to do this to the best of your okay. ability thank so you patricia patricia that is your three minutes so sorry thank you thank you all right we have no more online communication okay so that is our public comment so what do we think folks i'll open it up to council discussion well i i think joe should give Catherine his phone number she's right back there for one thing So that would be, a, I'm sure she would appreciate it and you would too, so thank you. And, and for me, I'm, I'm just, and I'm no sound engineer, I don't know how sound travels um, because I live, you know, much closer to these events than, you know, the Greenview neighborhood and, and Villa Way as the crow flies, but, you know, I, I am eastward, so maybe, I, I don't know, and this is a question for Joe, I don't know what, which direction your speakers face um, and how that impacts this because um, I know that like me being east but still within you know a two to three block three block radius I think uh, you know I didn't hear much and I had to even think what's that what's that nice little music I hear oh yeah something's happening you know I had to re-remember that it, it that it was going on so um, I, I just wonder I mean and I guess maybe <laughs> come back up to the mic because I'm asking you a question. But I mean, what what is the positioning of the speakers and how does that, I mean, impact how sound travels? I'm sure that you guys have done a lot more research on that. Yes. Um, and then also my other secondary question, which might be for you or maybe I'll wait, but just about, the, I, I don't know, the, these decibel readings don't really mean anything to me because mm -hmm. I don't know what is like normally allowed. Um, so I just, just a clarification on that as well. So the, the stage is positioned, um, I think if you guys have the diagram originally, it's south facing uh, on N Street. And we have proposed putting basically a massive 26 foot truck behind it. Um, the way that sound travels, there is that fence along the south east side, is that right? Southeast, southwest, right? The southwest side. And that doesn't really do a lot of um, absorption, sound absorption. 
The other option is to reposition the stage. Um, we could do that and face it against to more towards the building. So instead of angling it straight along N Street, which is what we have been doing, we could angle it to where it's facing at an angle more towards the fence uh, on the southwest side and have it hit the building directly. Um, there will still be some bounce back from the sound like hitting the building but there will also be more absorption in terms of like there's vendor booths over there and there's uh, a lot of people of course in the later hours there are more people and that helps with sound absorption we also don't fly our speakers um, so that helps with not travel not having the sound travel too far uh, in terms of the base which was mentioned earlier um, i definitely think we could potentially even turn that down further. Um, most of the music that we play is not bass heavy music. Um, when we submitted the request originally to the council, we basically stipulated the types of music that were kind of not going to be played. Um, and heavy bass, rock and roll, like big hip hop acts, things like that, which kind of are more disruptive in nature um, or considered more on the noise side of things, if you will. Uh, we decided to avoid entirely because we knew we were outside and, and we're next to neighbors and so we want the the music that is being played to be more on the uplifting side um, where people feel good about the music and not so much um, that deep bass feel so that definitely taking that into account for the future shows i think would be great we can turn that down further okay just following up on that um so you're you're having live music and then do you have I'm going to use the word can, but that means, you know, DJ. Mm -hmm. Do you have DJ music? And is that's after you have your live concert, you go yes. to DJ. That's correct. Maybe that's where your bass is hitting. And I think that that could be. And the types of music that the DJs play um, is what we're, we're very kind of particular on that. Uh, mostly, like I said, because it, having type, certain types of music like that have more of the bass element, um, we don't put those acts on out there we save those for the jam <laughs> uh, so that it's a little more indoors and retained uh, over there because it is it's a more naturally more disruptive that we found to certain people so what time does the headliner usually start just well then? we could start them earlier uh, the headliner some artists that we have lined up um, require to be the last act playing on the stage the bigger ones and so that's going to be a little hard to work through we could do that and then have the exit music for like 30 minutes but having them too early or, or early early would be uh something that they wouldn't be um, agreeable to which is sad but yeah how long do they usually play? one hour to one and a half hours depending on the set times of which artists that we're bringing in yeah i mean i'm just thinking that now that it's we're heading into fall and it's getting darker earlier that um that might be nicer that it, i know that um yeah you may want everything to happen earlier because it's getting dark earlier but when they talked to us originally they were looking at employees getting off later mm -hmm. and then we yeah. wanted the employees to be able to have an opportunity to come that's correct um <clears throat> i just see in the packet there's just a uh major special event permit for july 23rd there are, do we have to have that permit for the other days as well uh yeah he does have a permit for each of those days the one uh, that was in your packet i just utilized you know basically the same staff report just an example of the what initial it was. one okay. that i had but they all it looked identical he had all of the dates listed on it um yeah and so their dates requested still moving into the future are uh, September 10th so this weekend September 24th August or October 8th 15th and 29th are the remaining dates mm -hmm. on the current permit and then he handles the liquor license sort of one show at a time yes um, and he comes in and gets those signed for each show and then as part of the um, the permit application is it required for uh, for the applicant to show you know like a layout of the stage and and things like that how are things going to be oriented uh, yes if there were to be changes you've got in your packet on page 116 uh, the initial layout that they had uh, that they've submitted to us S 
So I was just going to ask another question. So your headliner plays from when to when? Currently, um, the way it's set up, they would play 10.30 until midnight. We could push them to play 10 to 11.30 or in that realm to help with the exodus of people and then to bring the volume down a little bit is what we had initially um, proposed here uh, and the solutions to helping with the noise later. Um, most of the time, a headliner wouldn't be agreeable to play before 10 p.m. Um, that you're bringing in for like a bigger name act. So if your headliner plays from uh, until 11.30, what happens after 11.30? Is that your DJ? So the headliner, uh, in most cases, would be a musical act that in, in our, the type of music that we put on in the evening hour, the later night hours, is going to be uh, in some, f some, vo some form of uh, um, a manipulated music. So they're going to have some element where they either have a looping track or um, CDJs or things like that. So where they can manipulate the sound. So it's not just like a regular band. You're not going to hear those hi hats and, and other things you would hear uh, with a normal band setup. So sometimes they're DJs and sometimes they are more live singers with uh, components of, I guess, a DJ for lack of a better word. So, can, can I just add to, I mean, I feel like a lot of people are like, it's just a DJ, it's not music, like it's not even a real band, but I mean, the, the technical expertise that goes into being a professional DJ and being able to use loop tracks like that and do, you know, that that is a real performance that somebody is putting on, um, just a reminder. So, I mean, I know most of your headlock, headline tracks are prop headline acts are probably EDM, you know, electronic music artists, um, mm -hmm. which again, that scene is incredibly popular and incredibly has grown a lot here locally too. Um, and, and so just, I don't know, the, the reminder that though it's like not a live band and maybe you don't think it's music to like a lot of people in this community, like those DJ acts are like really like what they want to see. Yeah. Um, I wasn't put, I was just trying to understand because you were saying that that after your headliner, which could be a DJ, mm -hmm. that you then you're going to another kind of music to have disperse people or whatever yeah. you're doing to disperse mm -hmm. people so they can go home. And that would be more of a, a quiet down tempo, uh, more like a melodic house mm -hmm. type of music, if we're being specific, um, to help people exit because after you have that higher energy set which is generally you're going to be your headliner people when you play something more down tempo naturally people kind of want to gravitate towards something else because it's sort of like playing closing time at a bar you know last call okay right. so let's get down to brass tacks what are what are we comfortable with here Let, let's let's hear it let's get there so another question i have is um can we just get like a rough idea how far away villa way is from this is it like a couple blocks? Is it a thousand feet? Because um, it is—it seems like it's a little bit of a distance. Hmm. You have several streets. When you get on Eleventh Street and you're going down there on N, and then you go, they're past Q, and then you turn on Villa Way. It's one of the last streets before you get onto Jane's. And you have the church, and then it's here. So down Eleventh Street, yeah. I would have to so that's okay you know? Karen that's okay I think I got it. just it's a few blocks yeah. sounds like okay cool um, yeah so I guess you know for me getting down to brass tacks um, you know we have some complaints from people in the immediate community or in the immediate area and then you know we have this uh, letter that Catherine took time to put together which I appreciate um, and she also took the time to collect signatures from her neighbors from Villa Way, which is, you know, significant distance away. I don't think it was maybe the distance all of us were thinking about um, when we approved this. And so, you know, just to be, you know, like you said, get down to brass tacks and to be black and white about it. Uh, I mean, to me, it's a real simple question, right? Um, what do we prioritize as a council? Is it the... Uh, you know, we were talking about how, what are the benefits of this? It's creating entertainment um, for the community, um, workers. It's also, uh, you know, a um, financial gain for some of the people participating. Um, and then on the other side of that, we have, you know, longtime residents, families. Um, and so how do we find that balance? And, you know, for me, and it's a, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I get business. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I always feel like we need to prioritize uh, residents and families because I feel like that, to me, is Arcata and the you know community that 
um, you know, people people love and live here for. So, you know, I, I want to be able to find a compromise. I like some of the stuff I'm hearing about. Can we change the stage and stuff like that? Um, you know, I would like to see um, a new plan with some of these changes implemented. You know, maybe if it's you know some way we can do some sound testing before another event. Um, you know, stuff like that. Um, but until then, um, you know. I'd like to, I, I feel like the best in it and then also acknowledging uh, the fact that once the event does stop that there is still you know kind of commotion and a disturbance in the neighborhoods when people are dispersing from the event and um, go ahead sure so uh, to just touch on a couple of the points you just made uh, we have made uh, arrangements for people that are in the immediate area or disrupted by these events to be able to reach out and for us to have accommodations for them for the evenings of those events so that if they are d that disrupted while they're sleeping that we can relocate them for the evening to a very nice hotel yeah. um, to be able to so that they can you know still have their peace and these events aren't scheduled every night they're once you know basically every other week um, and it is is providing a great opportunity for artists and the amount of jobs that are being created that would be absolved uh, due to lack of revenue is also something to to note um, and then in terms of the part where people are leaving we do provide uh, those guards that walk into the neighborhoods along the streets to be able to usher people along and we do remind people on the mic before they're leaving to be respectful of the neighbors. Sometimes that doesn't happen, um, you know, but we are also conscious of over-serving, which is when people are gonna be more prone to being disruptive in the neighborhoods is when they're leaving and they've been intoxicated or something like that. So we do put a lot of effort into helping those people along. Um, we kind of push them towards the jam now, naturally. And that usually happens, you know, before midnight if people have, have left and at the last event, it was pretty well cleared out by midnight actually yeah just you know also to be clear i mean i absolutely commend you for putting this all together i mean i know you know i've been a part of event planning in the past and it's a lot of work bringing all the pieces together making it all fit together you know it's, it's definitely a lot of work and you have it sounds like you know made a big effort to reach out to the community and you're here now and you're you know willing to, to work and try to problem solve and stuff um so yeah my opinion right now is um yeah, if, if I was going to wave a magic wand and do this, you know, how I thought it should be done, um, you know, we bring this back at the next council meeting. Between now and then, uh, you know, you do your best to come up with a new layout, you know, some of your new suggestions. Um, and it also gives you an opportunity another couple weeks to, you know, go back through some of these neighborhoods and residences and talk with them. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I, I do feel like that uh, my, right now, my gut is, is that, you know, until we can find some, you know, solutions that we're confident in that's gonna you know protect our our families and our residents um i in with the you know acknowledging that it takes time for these crowds to disperse you know maybe up to another half hour or so um you know if the event ends at 10 it won't be over till 10 30 essentially um so my personal feeling right now is that we should leave it at uh go back to you know what it was 10 p.m until we can find accommodations for the community Well, I see you only have five more. That's mm -hmm. it. That's and they're, it. They're not every. They're not every um, weekend. No, and they're only on Saturday nights. And, and that is exactly why we have a person sitting behind you that isn't making them because she does not hear every weekend. <clears throat> so I, I'm thinking that um, I may, if you, if you could figure out how to stop at 11:30, we can do that. I think that. That could work okay and then send yeah. people to the pub or to jambalaya or to everett's or yeah i i, I think um you know to be able to have a, a last call cut it off and turn it down at 11 and encourage people to leave to go to the jam okay um i will add um and i think i shared this with you i i am um, subject to the foot traffic i am on the super highway between the pub and the plaza and that i honestly didn't notice too much more craziness than a normal bar going night um, on nights of the events um, maybe more people take 8th street i don't know um, but you just just to throw that in there but to, yeah. to be able I, i'm just thinking the way to make your headlining you know acts acts be able to to, to work but I, I think you know and i, I don't work with promoters but 11 p.m is pretty late you know and 
And I think that, you know, a headliner, if you give them the amount of time that they want to play to, to go to then and then encourage the event to, to move, you know, to the jam um, is a pretty solid plan. And then to continue, like we spoke before, I mean, we brought it back because a couple of us were um, want, wanting to talk about it a little bit more again, and we did get some complaints. Um, but maybe in the future, though, we had discussed that, you know, with uh, Karen that the mayor and I could, you know, decide, okay, 11 now really isn't working. What are we going to do next um, in, in the future? You know, kind of make that an option as well, just so, you know, we're not seeing this item at every single time you want to throw an event um, just for, for ease of the process as well. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with that. So I would, I would make a motion because we need to do something. And I would move that um, you can discontinue your music at 11 o'clock. And that's what I'm sort of hearing from here. And you were agree agreeing to that. Maybe not enthusiastically, but uh, agreeing to that and being able to move people on to other areas. And you have five more events. So my, I move that you can continue until 11 o'clock. I would just add, you know, if you consider adding to that motion that the city uh, sends a letter to the neighbors explaining their justification for going past 10 p.m. and, um, you know, not, not supporting at an earlier time. I, I don't want to add that to it. He's already, I have a motion on the floor. If we want to discuss it f further, someone could second it and then they could just, we could amend it if they choose to. I'll go ahead and second. So we have a motion from Councilmember Stillman and a second from Councilmember Matthews. Um, let's take and, a... And I don't agree with what you're suggesting, that we send a letter out. I believe you've made those contacts. You made another contact with Catherine. She can now give your phone number to the entire neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, and, and I know Joe has been super responsive. So thank you very you know. much. But... Um, I, it's only... We, okay. Okay, thank you, ma'am. You had your three minutes, so we have a motion and a second from Councilmember Stillman and a and a second from Councilmember Matthews to discontinue the music at 11 p.m. for the Arcane Artist Permit. Do we want to add the part? And I'm sorry to interrupt oh, you please. about um, for the next the further events to have the mayor and the vice mayor be able to. Um, if if Councilmember Stillman wants to add that to her, yes, motion. I would add that. Okay. All right, then I'll second that. So do they have to agree on it together? Just one person overrides the other? How does that work? Because that's not really a thing. I think they can agree. I, I so think a unanimous can, I think vote. we can work with the city manager right. to be able to, to come to a conclusion that's going to work for the, the community. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. We shall vote on it. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Okay. So motion passes 3-1. Uh, thank you. Okay. And that being said, um, we are in a later hour. So let's take a quick five-minute break. I know some of us might have to go to the bathroom and stretch our legs. Thank so thank you.
Okay, we are back from our short break, um, and that brings us into new business item 11. Uh, item A under new business, introduce ordinance number 1558, amending the conflict of interest code, title two, administration, chapter eight, conflict of interest, article two, city employees, section 2915A. And can we please have a staff report from city attorney Diamond? Sure, thank you, vice mayor and council members. Um, this is, uh, mandated by the FPPC every two years. You have to review your conflict of interest code and make revisions as necessary. So the revision that you're being asked to make is acknowledging the um, change that the council approved, I believe it was in August uh, recently, um, in when the information technology manager was reclassified to the deputy director of information technology. So all you would be doing would be amending the ordinance to make that change in the list of designated employees. Great. Thank you, City Attorney Diamond, for keeping it quick and simple. Um, do we have any questions or comments on this item from the council? Well, you know, I'll move for adoption. And if we have a second, then we can do have discussion on the motion. I'll yeah, second. I feel like um, I don't understand why this is limited to just these people that are you know, designated. It seems like it would be make sense. It would make sense and be ethical that it applied to, you know, maybe like all full-time city employees. And just one example I can think of, there are a lot of staff that do research and, you know, provide information to some of these people that are designated that potentially, um, they're, they're plotting right now how to stop me from moving on. Um, but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to have a motion on the floor because yeah. it's really I, protocol. I, I wanted asked. to uh, correct the motion. You would be introducing it um, and you would consent to not adopting it, consenting to okay. read by title. And so I'll you. introduce it, ordinance number 1558, amending conflict of interest code, title two. Uh, administration chapter eight, conflict of interest, article two, city employees, section 2915, and parentheses A. Wave reading of the text. And consent. Wave reading of the text. Thank you. Yeah. So we're just amending it, right? There already exists a conflict of interest. Correct. Then I second. And this is our and opportunity this, to make future. See what is changing is. And, and this is something that is brought down to us by the state, by the FPPC. Correct. Of what positions, you know, do designate. Yes, the, constitute this conflict of interest. The, the FPPC regulations require the city's conflict of interest code to designate those employees who participate in the dis, in decision making of the city council or the planning commission in such a way that might materially impact their economic interests. Now there's a balance here that, that needs to be made between identifying those employees whose economic interests could foreseeably be materially impacted because of their participation in decision making um, f and then making everybody disclose because of First Amendment considerations um, and, and protect, I'm sorry, Fourth Amendment considerations, protecting people's privacy. And that balance is what the FPPC has struck in specifying that the list of designated em employees are, are only those who participate in the decision in a manner to um, materially impact their uh, economic interests. The uh, city has traditionally um, listed, designated all of the uh, directors, department directors and managers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yeah, I feel like one example, like Delo, for example, like I don't feel like she's listed here, but she does participate, I feel like sometimes in decision making. I mean, we have staff members that, you know, uh, are representatives to committees, which also influence decisions. And so that's just where I'm coming from. I feel like, you know, in the interest of the public um, and, you know, just doing what's ethical and right that we could expand this list. I'm happy to go with the state recommendations. We have a motion, a second on the floor. Let's take public comment on this item, please. But these actually aren't state recommendations. Let's take public comment on okay. this item, please. But they're not state recommendations, to be clear. FPPC. All right. I'm not seeing any input. My bad. I misspoke. Thank you, Council Member Watson, for correcting me so greatly. Thank you. You're welcome. I misspoke. You're welcome. Uh, there is no online public comment on this item. Anybody here in person? It's your chance. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, 
All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Okay. Motion passes 3-1. Thank you. Okay, that brings us now to oral and written communications. Um, item number 12, the city appreciates this public input. This time is provided for people to address the council um, on items that are not on the agenda. Again, please note pursuant to Brown Act that the council cannot discuss or take actions on items that are not listed or posted on the agenda. At the end of all, all oral and written communications, the council may respond to statements. Supported requests that require council action are set by the council for future agendas or referred to staff. Speakers addressing the council here may be limited to three minutes with a maximum of five minutes. Today we are limiting it to three minutes. Um, and if you are in person and wanting to give public comment, please line up at the podium. And if you are on Zoom, please press star nine now if you are on the phone and you would like to make public comment or raise your hand on Zoom. Speakers are limited to three minutes. When is your time, you will be unmuted and invited to speak. So please begin, Joanne. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanne McGarry and I'm here um, at the end of this meeting. Uh, to talk a little bit about um, the future of our town and plans that are being discussed currently and the climate realities that are existing. And um, I was going back over the three years ago when the Coastal Commission was here in Eureka meeting about various matters. They first met about the Indianola cutoff and creating a bypass type of thing, and that was discussed. And then I think the next day, it was a three-day event, um, we had the opportunity to hear directly from uh, Alderon Laird, who made a presentation about sea level rise and its effect on the 101 corridor. I think as we look to the expansion of development in areas close to the bay, such as the Gateway area, it would be really, really good to have Alderon Laird himself give a presentation to the public that's on video, like the, he did to the Coastal Commission, which was a jaw dropper for the Coastal Commissioners when it came to 101. So I just think that um, getting information about all these controversial topics that people are sharing with you now, getting an expert in here to talk about it now so we don't have to dredge things through the mud literally um, and, and hear what he has to say, a geologic uh, uh, expert as well. So let's just get this out of the way, not wait for the EIR. Um, because this is a topic that just keeps getting brought up, so let us get an expert opinion, not through staff, but to the public, to the council, um, to all of us to hear. So the Coastal Commission did it, the City Council of Arcata can do it. Thank you. Um, I live in the uh, Creamery District, uh, really close, right in the Gateway area. I'm still learning about the Gateway Project, but um, I just wanted to uh, come and share that as a family living right in that zone with um, a property that we're so excited to have and um, hopefully pass on to our children that I would be concerned about having apartment buildings built. So p the potential of business owners be able to build apartments right around us i would feel concerned about that even at four stories it feels like an awful lot of windows um, that could potentially end up right close to our yard that could see into our yard and see our children every day um, you know so for safety um, i would just love for this arcata city council to consider for the safety of residents and um, for the comfort of residents to consider not building um, apartment buildings, um, you know, more than two stories um, <laughs> would be my dream, um, but um, to just consider not having them um, within the surrounding blocks of already existing Arcata residences. Um, so I just wanted to share that. I know that you guys have a big job to look for, uh, to support the necessary um, growth of our city and affordable housing. And I'd certainly appreciate that. Um, thank you. Good evening, Fred Wise. Um, you mentioned the audio of the joint study session on the arcada1.com website. I, uh, I did get audio tracks from Eric Black there's three separate audio tracks. Some are better for different speakers, and, and the reader or the listener can switch among them. Um, they could be combined, but it would take a few hours of work. Um, it, but it is a problem in that room setting to get good audio. Um, I'm speaking tonight about the um, possibility of L Street becoming 
a linear park, which I think would be a real jewel for Arcata. Uh, I've spoken strongly about this before. The, um, uh, the presentation by Todd Tregenza was very good, but it was missing um, a whole lot of things. And some of the diagrams were not uh, accurately displayed. There was some misrepresentation. I have um, writing an article about that. It'll be done in a couple of days. I've taken all the slides. It's much easier to see the content of the slides when it's a still picture as opposed to on the screen there. And there's a transcription of every word he said and also the comments and questions afterwards. Um, I've said, and I'll say again, there needs to be a depiction of the alternative. We have, uh, uh, we, we were told a picture is worth a thousand words or more. Um, we need a, uh, the same kind of presentation for if K Street stayed as two lane, two way, and L Street became a linear park. Uh, I think if we saw that, we might see the value of that a little more clearly. Um, the, um, I feel that putting the southbound traffic on L, it, it does accomplish certain things, there's no question about it, but it's a car-oriented solution. Uh, my own feeling is that in 20 years, we're not gonna have as many cars, I hope, and, but we'll still have the road. The road is gonna last for 100 years. So it's, it's just kind of a short-term problem. And as Todd said, we, there is the capacity there for 3,000 or 3,500 more people in Arcata. Uh, it would about double it, and the, that road can handle it, as he said, with uh, adequate left turning lanes and that sort of thing. To give you an idea of why this is crucial now, the Ag Sales Building and the Amerigas sites are both considered to be uh, underutilized sites are ripe for development. The form base code has to be in place before those are developed, appropriate to the type of road that L Street is going to be. We determine what is going to be built on those two sites. Um, I think you understand that. The um, uh, transportation safety, they saw a different presentation, but as David Loya said, they are unlikely to change their minds. I think he felt, and as do I, that they understood the pros and cons of both solutions. Uh, there's more on my website when you get to it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Fred. Um, do we have anybody waiting online to comment? Uh, there's no online or, oh, there's one. All right. Uh, go ahead, James. Hi, I'll make it brief. Uh, did want to follow up on Fred because there's so many good things to talk about with the linear park. Um, as one of the items within the gateway draft, they do want to see um, quality spaces and trails within 200 feet of all the living spaces and with the linear park you know not only as that trail that can be the artery to that it also you know represents this gathering space you know something almost like you would see in Europe or in, in cities and and green spaces are considered a really valuable resource for how people get around towns and you know they're welcomed in a lot of their areas um, you know, and, and beyond that, um, I, 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 there's a lot of things, you know, and I'll talk about in the future, but I, I, I'm, in, I'm encouraged by Fred's comments, and I hope that's something you will take into consideration, because so I think it is a valuable aspect to this development, because it is going to represent one of the, you know, potential guaranteed parks, you know, it's, it is a, a, a quarter that's there, it can be enhanced, it can, it can be more than it is right now, and I hope you'll consider that. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Anybody else on Zoom waiting to make comment? No other online oral communications. Okay, thank you. With that, we will close um, oral communications and come to finally item 13, which is council and staff reports. Um, do we have any staff updates? Nope, no further updates tonight. Okay, and let's hear from our council updates. Okay, well. Okay. <clears throat> One thing is I, I'm so happy that Tar Tamara is finishing the building um, on H Street. She painted one side of it and now she has started on the front and it'll be really attractive to have it because it looks so terrible. So I have a statement to read. So my name is Alex Stillman and I'm on the City Council of Arcata. And I've been waiting for a letter from the Fair Political Practices Commission to determine if I had a conflict of interest. The letter finally arrived and stated, 
the act prohibits Councilmember Stillman from taking part in decisions relating to the gateway area plan because it's reasonably foreseeable that those two decisions would have a disqualifying material effect on her interest in multiple parcels of residential and commercial real estate, all of which are located within 500 feet of the gateway area plan boundary. The Fair Political Practices Commission regulates how a disqualified council member to con can continue to communicate with the public or the media and, are and have been provided of an advice letter that issued uh, that had issued earlier on how to correctly use social media if disqualified. An official, quote unquote, an official's use of social media to make a widely available public post regarding a matter in which he or she is disqualified, conflict of interest, is innocuous to the official authorization, well, it's authorizing, uh, this I'm quoting exactly what he said, a quoting a newspaper article or appearing on the radio program regarding such a matter or discussing such a matter with members of the community. We caution a highway that most posts must be widely available and may not be permitted if the official has limited number of followers or subscribers. Moreover, the official may not directly message city members, officers, employees, or consultants. So I'm pleased that I'm going to be able to support housing in Arcata, whether it's in the Gateway or Valley West or anywhere else in the community, um, by using social media. I've met the threshold of having enough followers on Instagram and fa Facebook to be able to utilize social media. And I would appreciate anyone that wants to follow me on either one of those and up my numbers, I would appreciate it. So thank you very much, and that's my statement. Thank you. Councilmember Stillman. Um, we're going down the line. Okay. Uh, the iBlock party was wonderful. It was great to be back after the pandemic. There was some awesome music, great fundraiser for the Sister City Project. It was amazing to see the community out there enjoying themselves, having some great food, enjoying some local beverages. Um, it was just a really great time and a super awesome event to be a part of and support um, and looking forward to you know seeing what this committee will continue to do for our community. So it was really a great event. Um, go ahead. Your mic wasn't on, but yes, the chamber or the main street is getting close to having a position ready to hire somebody. That's yes. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I just was thinking earlier the we you know touched on the public safety committee's recommendations. Um, so maybe you know if the council agreed, that would be a good thing to to bring back and talk about in the future. Um, and that's all I have. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would also be interested in, in looking at some of, I remember there was some talk and we had a presentation about the uh, mural projects uh, to be on the bridge and stuff like that. So um, I think there are quite a few of us that would be interested in uh, hearing more about those projects and working on wonderful beautification things that help our Cal Poly community. Okay, um, dates of future meetings, there's nothing, and now I, f I feel like I get to use the gavel because I'm the one leading the meeting, it's the first time. Okay, meeting adjourned. <laughs>